Book 54, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 54, Chapter 6. THE ACCESSION OF SOLOMON The new king was hardly seated on the throne before he was called to repress with a high hand a second and dangerous attempt of Adonijah to obtain the kingdom. As is usual in Oriental countries, the influence of Bathsheba the Queen Mother was very great. To her Adonijah preferred a request that she would intercede with the king in obtaining for him the hand of Abishag the Shunammite his father's latest wife, 1 Kings 2.17. Bathsheba sought an interview with Solomon, who instantly saw in this petition a design upon the throne, and declaring that Adonijah had forfeited his claim to the indulgence, extended to him after the late rebellion, directed that he should be put to death by the hand of Benaiah. But he divined that others were concerned in the insinuating request, and notably the high priest Abiathar, and Joab the commander-in-chief. The former, in consideration of his past services, was not put to death, but simply degraded from his high office, and ordered to live in retirement at Anathoth, a Levitical city, about three miles north of Jerusalem whereby the word of the Lord concerning the house of Eli was fulfilled, 1 Samuel 2, 31-33. News of these events no sooner reached the ears of Joab than he fled for refuge within the curtains of the tabernacle at Gibeon, and caught hold of the horns of the altar. Thither, however, Solomon sent Benaiah with orders to put him to death, Benaiah went and told his old companion in arms the king's command, but Joab refused to stir from sanctuary, and the other returned to the king for fresh instructions. Solomon bade him not spare, but fall upon him even at the altar, urging his execution as a just recompense for the murder of Abna and Amasa. Thereupon he returned once more, and fell upon him at the altar, and obtained the important post of commander-in-chief, while Zadok succeeded to the high priesthood. 1 Kings 2, 28-34 Though David had spared the life of Shimei, he had on his deathbed cautioned Solomon against him, and now, possibly owing to some unrecorded symptoms of disaffection, the young king renewed the concession, but on condition that Shimei confined himself to the city of Jerusalem, and did not stray behind the brook Kidron, which separated him from the road to his old home at Bahurim. For three years Shimei carefully complied with this condition, but two of his slaves fleeing to Akshish, king of Gath, he went thither and brought them back. This sealed his fate. Intelligence of what he had done was conveyed to Solomon, who sent for him, and ordered his executions by the hands of Benaiah. 1 Kings 2, 36-46 Shortly before this last event, the king convened a general assembly of all the notables of the realm at Gibeon, where was not only the venerable tabernacle of the wanderings, but the brazen altar of burnt sacrifice. Second Chronicles 1, 3-5 There accordingly were gathered together all the great officers of state, the judges, the governors, and the chief of the fathers, and a thousand burnt offerings were consumed on the altar. On the night following this solemn ceremonial, the Lord appeared in vision to Solomon as he slept, and bade him prefer any petition he desired. Impressed with the magnitude of the office to which he had been called, as yet humble in his own sight, and mindful of the mercy bestowed upon his father, the young king prayed not for riches or honor or long life, or the life of his enemies, but for a wise and understanding heart, that he might know how to rule his people. His prayer pleased the Lord, and because he had requested nothing for himself, he who is wont to give to the sons of men more than they ask or think, 
not only promised him wisdom and knowledge, but assured him that all the blessings he had not asked should be added unto him, including length of days, if he, for his part, took heed to observe the statutes and commandments of Jehovah, as his father had done before him. 1 Kings 3, 6-14 Returning to Jerusalem, the king offered burnt offerings and thank offerings to the Lord before the Ark of the Covenant, and celebrated a sacrificial feast with his whole court. 1 Kings 3.15 Very shortly he was called upon to give proof of that sagacity and clearness of judgment, especially in judicial cases, so much prized by Orientals. Of two women inhabiting one house together, each had an infant child. The mother of one overlaid hers while she was asleep, and rising at midnight laid it in the bosom of the other woman, taking her live child in its place. In the morning the latter discovered the deception that had been practiced upon her, and demanded the living infant. This the other woman refused, claiming it for her own, and both of them appealed to Solomon who commanded the living child to be divided into two halves, one of which should be given to each. The anguish of the real and the cruel acquiescence of the pretended mother in this sentence decided the point in a moment, and proved the sagacity of the king. And besides judicial sagacity, Solomon was eminent for his attainments. He was deeply versed in all the knowledge of his age, his wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country, and all the wisdom of Egypt. 1 Kings 4.30 In the course of his life he spake three thousand proverbs, of which a considerable portion remain in the book of Proverbs, and his songs, of which the Song of Songs alone survives, were a thousand and five. He spoke or wrote also of trees, from the lofty cedar of Lebanon to the humble hyssop that springeth out of the wall, of beasts, of fowl, of creeping things, and of fishes. His fame spread abroad among surrounding nations, and there came of all people to hear his wisdom. 1 Kings 4.34 End of Book 54, Chapter 6 Recording by Lawrence Trask Book 9, Chapter 7 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 9, Chapter 7 The Building of the Temple. 1 Kings 5 through 8, 2 Chronicles 2 through 7, B.C. 1012 to 1005. Mindful of the repeated instructions of his father, Solomon no sooner received the congratulations of Hiram, king of Tyr, upon his coming to the throne, than he sent to that monarch requesting that he would let him have Sidonian artisans and a supply of cedar wood from the forests of Lebanon for the construction of the temple. Hiram responded with alacrity to the request, and a regular treaty was entered into between the two kings. Solomon bound himself to send yearly twenty thousand cores of wheat and twenty cores of oil to the Phoenicians, while Hiram undertook to float cedar trees and fir trees to Joppa, and to send a number of skilled artificers to Jerusalem. For the purpose of felling the timber, a levy of thirty thousand Israelites was made, who were placed under Adoniram. Ten thousand were employed at a time, and relieved each other every month, spending a month in the mountains of Lebanon, and the other two months at their own homes. First Kings, verses 13 and 14. Besides these, seventy thousand were employed as porters, and eighty thousand as hewers in the various quarries. These latter were bond slaves, remnants of the Canaanites, who had not been expelled from the land. Under the eye of the Tyrian master builders, they hewed and squared and beveled the stupendous blocks, 
some measuring even seventeen and eighteen feet, for the foundation of the sacred edifice. The site, which had been already selected by David, was the eminence of Moriah, on the east of the city, rendered sacred at once as the spot where Abraham had offered up Isaac, and where the plague had been stayed during the last rain. Its rugged top was leveled with immense labor. Its sides, which to the east and south were precipitous, were faced with a wall of stone, built up perpendicular from the bottom of the valley, so as to appear to those who looked down of most terrific height, a work of prodigious skill and labor, as the immense stones were strongly mortised together and wedged into the rock. On this site, after three years of preparation, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, and the four hundred and eightieth after the departure from Egypt, the foundations were laid. No sound of hammer or axe or any tool of iron was heard as the structure rose. First Kings, verse 7. Every beam already cut and squared, every stone already hewn and beveled, was laid silently in its appointed sight. Like some tall palm, the noiseless fabric sprung. Within a quadrangle formed by a solid wall was an open court, afterwards known as the Court of the Gentiles. Within this, surrounded by another wall, and on a higher level, was the court of the Israelites, and within this, and on a still higher level, the court of the priests. The temple itself was built on the model of the ancient tabernacle, but of more costly and durable materials, and, like it, consisted of the porch, the holy place, and the holy of holies. 1. The porch or hall which faced the east was ten cubits deep from east to west, by twenty inches width from north to south, and thirty cubits high. Either within, or as some think on either side of it, rose two brazen pillars, the one called Jachin, durability, and the other Boaz, strength. Their capital is ornamented with network, chainwork, and pomegranates. 2. The holy place the dimensions of which were exactly double those in the tabernacle, was forty cubits long by twenty wide and thirty high. Its walls were of hewn stone, wainscoted with cedar and overlaid with gold, and adorned with beautiful carvings representing cherubim, fruit, and flowers. It was entered by folding doors, similarly overlaid with gold and richly embossed, the floor was of cedar, bordered over with planks of fir or cypress. The ceiling was of fir, but both, as indeed every part, overlaid with gold in the richest profusion. In the holy place, as in the tabernacle, stood the golden altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right and five on the left. 3. A rich veil of the brightest colors separated the holy place from the holy of holies, which was a perfect cube of twenty cubits. Here was the original ark, overshadowed by two colossal cherubim of olive wood overlaid with gold, ten cubits in height. There stood at each end, north and south, and faced each other, each having two wings expanded, so that one wing of each touched over the ark and the other touched the wall. Outside the holy place stood a great tank or sea of molten brass, ten cubits in diameter, thirty round, five high, and capable of holding two thousand baths. It was supported on twelve oxen, three turned each way, and its rim was ornamented with blossoms. Besides this there were ten lavers, for the purpose of ablutions, which stood on movable bases of brass. Each side of these was formed in three panels, and adorned with figures of oxen, lions, and cherubim. The great brazen altar of burnt sacrifice, twenty cubits long and ten high, stood on the exact site of the threshing floor of Arona. At length, by the seventh month in the eleventh year of Solomon's reign, the work was completed, and the king invited the chiefs of different tribes, all the notables of the realm, 
as also the entire priestly and Levitical body, to the solemn dedication. He himself took his seat on a raised throne of brass. The sacrificers stood before the altar of burnt offering, surrounded by the choir arrayed in white robes, and playing on cymbals, psalteries, and harps, while the assembled nation crowded the courts without. Countless sheep and oxen were the first laid on the brazen altar. Then, from under the covering, where David had placed it, the priests solemnly brought the Ark of the Covenant to the folding floors of the temple. These were open, and then, past the table of showbread and the golden candlesticks, and the altar of incense, it was conveyed through the veil to its appointed place, and the cherubim spread over it their wings, and received it, as it were, under their protection. At this moment the choir lifted up their voices with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and made one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, whose mercy endureth for ever. And simultaneously the temple was filled with a cloud. First Kings 8, 10, and 11. The glory of the Lord descended, and Jehovah took possession of his new abode. Thereupon the king, rising on his brazen throne, and kneeling down upon his knees, spread forth his hands toward heaven, and offered up a solemn and sublime prayer. As he concluded with the petition, Arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength, fire flashed forth from the glory already filling the temple, and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices, Second Chronicles 7, 3. Well, the priests stood without, blinded with the excess of splendor, and the people, bowing with their faces to the ground, worshipped and praised the Lord. The ceremony of the dedication lasted seven days, and was succeeded by the Feast of Tabernacles, which was continued for two weeks, or twice the usual time. During it, upward of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep were partly offered in sacrifice, and partly made the materials of a great sacrificial feast, from which, on the twenty-third day of the seventh month, the king sent the people away, glad and merry in heart, for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David, and to Solomon, and to Israel his people. Second Chronicles 7.10 End of Book 9, Chapter 7 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio Book 9, Chapter 8 Of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 9, Chapter 8. Solomon's Reign Continued. 2 Kings 9-11. to 2 Chronicles 8-9. to B.C. 1005-975. to before the temple was thus completed, Solomon had proceeded to construct other magnificent buildings. Amongst these was a sumptuous palace for himself, surrounded with beautiful pleasure grounds, which stood within the city opposite to the temple, and occupied thirteen years in building. 1 Kings 7, 1. Another palace he built for Pharaoh's daughter, who he had espoused, and beside it the house of the forest of Lebanon. 175 feet long, half that measurement in width, and 50 feet high. The roof, which was made of cedar, was supported by four rows of cedar columns, and the whole received light from three rows of windows on each side. Adjoining it were the women's apartments, a banqueting hall, and spacious and luxuriant gardens. Other works were designed for use in security, among these were artificial reservoirs for supplying the city with water, and the strengthening or repairing of a fortress called Milo, 1 Kings 9.15, already begun by David, 2 Samuel, verse 9. Solomon also fortified Balath, 
Gezer, and the two Beth Horons on the great road toward the sea coast, the strong and important host of Hazor, to defend the entrance from Syria and Assyria. Megiddo to guard the Esdraelon plain, while for the protection of his eastern caravans he built Tadmor, afterwards called Palmyra, in the Syrian wilderness, and Tipsha, or Thepsacus, on the Euphrates, Second Chronicles 8, 3-6. to His reign was a period of great commercial activity. On the northwest the important kingdom of Phoenicia was united with him, by the bonds of a strict alliance. Once only did Hiram, king of Tyre, express any dissatisfaction with the dealings of his powerful friend. Solomon had bestowed upon him twenty cities, which he had conquered in the land of Galilee, on the borders of Asher. But when the Tyrian king came forth to see them, he was much dissatisfied. One of them, named Kabul, now Kabul, about eight or nine miles east of Akka, in his own Phoenician tongue, denoted displeasure, and this name he gave to them all. First Kings nine ten through thirteen, one. But Phoenician enterprise was turned to account in other directions. Having possession of the eastern shore of the Red Sea, Solomon strengthened the ports of Elath and Ezion Geber, the giant's backbone, and with the assistance of Tyrian shipwrights constructed a fleet, which sailed to Ophir, and returned with gold, silver, ivory, and other products. 1 Kings 9, 26-28 2. The Tyrian alliance opened up also the traffic of the Mediterranean. On every shore washed by this sea, Phoenician energy had founded colonies and opened trading ports, of which the chief was Tarshish, or Tartessus the Peru of Tyrian adventure, on the southern coast of Spain, at this time abounding in gold and silver mines. Hither Solomon's fleet sailed in company with that of Hiram, and brought back every three years of its precious products. 1 Kings 10.22 3. Another important outlet for trade was supplied by Egypt. Not only had Solomon espoused a daughter of Pharaoh, but in defiance of the Mosaic law, Deuteronomy 17.16, he exchanged the produce of his own country for the horses and chariots of Egypt, as also for the linen yarn spun from the flax, which the Nile Valley yielded in abundance, 1 Kings 10.28-29. 4. Last but not least important was the inland trade of the Arabian Peninsula, Caravans of the native tribes transported on camels the spices, incense, gold, precious stones, and valuable woods of the country, especially the almug or sandal, and brought them into the dominions of Solomon, or, if they were intended for his Tyrian allies, to Gezer and Beth Horon, whence they were transported to the port of Joppa. But though these several branches of commerce opened up to the Hebrew kingdom many and various sources of national prosperity, and tended to multiply the luxuries and magnificence of the court, this prosperity was on the surface only. Hidden beneath its external splendor were several cankers, which surely, though secretly, undermined the true life of the nation. First of all, this massing of gold and silver, as doubtless the Jewish lawgiver had foreseen, could only be brought about by a process of severe taxation. And while forced to bear burdens heavy and grievous, the nation saw the tide of commercial profits, instead of being fairly distributed among the people, flowing only into the royal exchequer. Secondly, these commercial alliances seriously affected the nation's allegiance to Jehovah. In imitation of other Oriental empires, Solomon surrounded himself with a numerous harem, having seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, First Kings eleven one through three. Besides the daughter of Pharaoh, he espoused women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, and as he grew old they turned away his heart from the worship of the true God. Three times indeed during the year he celebrated the festivals of Jehovah, First Kings nine twenty five 
but the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtaroth, of Moloch and Chemosh, found its way even into the holy city, and their hideous orgies were enacted hard by the oracles of God. 1 Kings 11, 5-8 through 8. At first, perhaps, there may have been few signs of weakness in a fabric so vast and so magnificent. In the figurative language of the sacred record, silver was in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar trees as sycamores. Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. In the enjoyment of profound peace, every man dwelt safely under his vine and under his fig tree. Princes administered the government of various portions of the empire. 1 Kings 4, 1 through 6. Officers deputed for the purpose provided victual for the royal table, and barley and straw for Solomon's forty thousand chariot horses. His twelve thousand war horses, 1 Kings 4, 26, and his swift mules. Kings and princes of subject provinces brought in their tribute at a fixed rate year by year. 1 Kings 10, 25. And when the Queen of Sheba came with her great train from distant Yemen, in Arabia, to prove the king with hard questions, and beheld his palace, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cup-bearers, and the ascent from his own palace to the temple, there was no spirit left in her, and she confessed that half of his fame and magnificence had not been told her. 1 Kings 10, 1 through 9. Before long, however, clouds began to gather, portending the coming storm. Once at Gibeon, on the occasion of his accession, again after the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings 3, 5, 4, 2. The Lord had appeared to Solomon, and on condition that he continued to walk in the ways of his father, had promised to crown him with prosperity and establish his dynasty, but at the same time had warned him that any apostasy would bring down severe punishment. But promise and warning had been alike forgotten, and when the Lord appeared for the third time, it was to announce that the kingdom should be rent from him. 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13. 1. The quarter whence danger first threatened was on the south in the land of Edom. When Joab invaded that country during the late rain, and for six months directed an indiscriminate massacre of the male population, Hadad, who was of the blood royal, and at that time a little child, was carried off into Egypt, where he was hospitably received by the reigning pharaoh, and rapidly rising in the royal esteem, obtained the hand of Taphanes, the sister of the Egyptian queen. On the death of David and of Joab, he returned from Egypt, and thirsting to break off the hard yoke of Jacob from the neck of Esau, organized a revolt in his native land, and began to threaten Solomon's communication with the Atlantic Gulf. 1 Kings 11, 15-22 2. A second adversary appeared in the northeastern provinces of the empire, Rezin the Syrian, the son of Eliada, flying from the defeat which his feudal lord Hadadezer, king of Zobah, had sustained at the hands of David, put himself at the head of a band of adventurers, and seized Damascus. Here he set up a petty kingdom, and became an adversary to all Israel all the days of Solomon and an impediment to the king's commerce with Tadmor and the Euphrates. 1 Kings 11, 23-25 3. But a far more formidable adversary appeared nearer home, when Solomon was constructing the fortifications of Milo under the citadel of Zion. He observed the industry and activity of Jeroboam, already known as a man of valor, the son of an Ephraimite named Nebat. Perceiving his worth, the king not only employed him on the works, but elevated him to the rank of collector of the taxes from his native tribe. On one occasion, as he was going out of Jerusalem, Jeroboam encountered the prophet Ahijah of the ancient sanctuary of Shiloh, and accompanied him to a neighboring field. 
When they were alone, the prophet rent the new outer robe in which he was attired into twelve pieces, and gave ten of them to Jeroboam, assuring him at the same time that he should reign over ten of the tribes, and that if he proved faithful to his laws, God would establish his dynasty as he had done that of David. 1 Kings 11, 26-39 News of this mysterious intimation in some way reached the ears of Solomon, and he sought to put Jeroboam to death, but the latter fled for refuge to the court of Shishak, Shishonk I, a powerful monarch who was bent on restoring Egypt to its former greatness. Here he remained during the rest of Solomon's reign. Departing from his earlier policy, the king had laid the burden of compulsory labor not only on the remnant of the Canaanites, but on the Israelites themselves. 1 Kings 5, 13, and 14 This increased the old jealousy of the great house of Joseph, and a man like Jeroboam was certain at any time to rally round him all the national discontent and ill-feeling during the once prosperous monarch. Well, the signs of coming danger were thus becoming more and more evident, Solomon's reign of forty years came to a close, B.C. 975. The hopes he might have inspired when first elevated to the throne had not been fulfilled. He had indeed built the promised temple. He had adorned Jerusalem with sumptuous palaces. His wisdom and learning had attracted the notice and roused the envy of distant monarchs. But he had not been mindful, save for a short time, while the example of David and the instructions of his preceptor Nathan were fresh in his memory of the vocation to which he had been called. His kingdom exhibited some of the worst faults of other Oriental monarchies. He had violated each and all of the fundamental principles of the kingdom as laid down by the great lawgiver of his nation. He had encouraged the worst forms of idolatry, had multiplied wives, had amassed enormous wealth, had laid heavy burdens on the people, and, sated with pomp and splendor and selfish luxuries, he had confessed the vanity of his life. Ecclesiastes 1, 12-18 The kingdom which Abraham had seen in vision, stretching from the river of Egypt to the gates of Damascus, had indeed been realized, but its unity was not destined to survive the reign of the son of David. End of Book 9, Chapter 8 Recording by Lawrence Trask Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Book 10, Kingdoms of Judah and Israel Part 1, Period of Mutual Hostility Chapter 1, The Revolt of the Ten Tribes 1 Kings Chapter 12, 2 Chronicles Chapter 10, B.C. 975 Rehoboam, the successor of Solomon, was forty-one years of age when he came to the throne. Though his title does not seem to have been disputed at Jerusalem, he deemed it right to obtain a more general and public recognition, and probably as a concession to the powerful house of Joseph, convened a solemn assembly of the tribes at Shechem, its ancient but ruined capital. On his arrival there he encountered Jeroboam, who had been summoned from his retreat in Egypt and now boldly appeared at the head of a deputation from all the tribes requesting a remission of the taxes and other heavy burdens which had been laid upon the nation during the late reign. Thus directly appealed to, Rehoboam requested a space of three days for deliberation, and during this period first consulted the old advisers of his father. They unanimously suggested that he should accede to the nation's request and lighten its burden, but besides these experienced counsellors, there were young men of rank who had been the king's companions and were now about his court. They could ill brook any line of policy that seemed likely to lower the power of their patron, 
and advised him to take up the matter with a high hand and by a firm denial of the nation's request, put down once and for all any similar demand. In an evil hour, Rehoboam listened to their counsel, and at the end of the three days, when the envoys again headed by Jeroboam were summoned into his presence, announced to them his final resolve. My father made your yoke heavy, said he in the true spirit of an oriental despot, and I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. First Kings chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. This senseless reply was no sooner made known to the tribes than it roused a general spirit of rebellion. What portion have we in David, exclaimed the great tribe of Ephraim, and what inheritance in the son of Jesse? To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. Compare Second Samuel 20 verse 1. The assembly broke up in confusion, and each man returned to his home. But Rehoboam did not yet discern the full force of the rising storm. He was unwise enough to send Adoram, who had been chief receiver of the tribute, during the reigns of his father and grandfather. Second Samuel 20 verse 24, 1 Kings 5 verse 14, to levy the usual Jews. But the fate of his envoy proved the strength of the popular feeling. All Israel stoned him with stones that he died, and the king himself was obliged to fly in haste to Jerusalem. His first impulse on his return was to punish the rebellious tribes, and for this purpose he gathered together an army of 180,000 men. But his preparations for a civil war were forbidden by Shemaiah, a man of God, who declared it to be the will of Jehovah that all hostility should be laid aside, for the rending of the kingdom was from him. 1 Kings 12 verses 18 to 24 Thereupon the projected war was given up, and the rebellion was complete. According to the new division of the land, 1. The kingdom of Judah included that tribe itself together with Benjamin, which transferred to it its allegiance, probably because Jerusalem was within its borders, and at least eventually a part, if not all, of the territory of Simeon and of Dan. For the present, Edom appears to have remained its faithful vassal, and guarded the caravan trade with Ophir, while Philistia continued for the most part quiet. 2. The kingdom of Israel, on the other hand, included that of the remaining eight tribes, Ephraim and half Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher and Naphtali, as well as the coastline between Akko and Joppa, on the west of the Jordan, Reuben, Gad and the remaining half-tribe of Manasseh on the east of that river. His vassal states were Moab, 2 Kings 3 and verse 4, and so much of Syria as had remained subject to Solomon. 1 Kings 11 verse 24 The first act of Jeroboam on being declared ruler of the ten tribes was to give a capital to his kingdom. For this purpose he rebuilt and fortified Shechem. His next step was to secure his dominions against his powerful northern neighbor Syria. He therefore fortified Penuel beyond the Jordan, which commanded the fords of Succoth and was on the great caravan road leading over Gilead to Damascus. But it required little reflection to convince him that, so long as the yearly pilgrimage summoned their thousands and tens of thousands to Jerusalem, his authority was but nominal. The Levitical class would constantly require to go up to the city of David in order of their courses, and the majority of them began to leave his kingdom for that of Judah. Without a temple, without the ark, without a priesthood, he felt he could not maintain his power. Within the boundaries, however, of his realm were two sanctuaries, Bethel in the south and Dan in the north. These, after some deliberation, 1 Kings 12 verse 28, he resolved to elevate into seats for national worship, which he hoped might rival the temple at Jerusalem. Instead, however, of erecting altars there in honor of Jehovah, he made two calves of gold, figures probably of Apis or Nevis, whose worship he had often witnessed during his residence in Egypt, and set them up in either sanctuary with the address, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. 1 Kings 12, verse 28. Moreover, at both places he established a new order of priests, not taken from the sons of Levi, but from the lowest of the people, and therefore absolutely dependent on himself 
and into this order anyone could obtain admission on sacrificing a young bullock and seven rams. Second Chronicles 13 verse 9 Having taken these measures, on the fifteenth day of the eighth month he proclaimed a solemn festival of dedication and went up to Bethel to offer incense in person on the altar. But at this critical moment, as he was standing there, a man of God from Judah appeared, who boldly confronted the king, denounced the idolatrous service and foretold the desecration of the altar by a future king of the house of Judah, Josiah by name, who would offer upon it the priests of the high places and burn men's bones upon it. See Second Kings 23 verse 15. Enraged at this outspoken defiance, Jeroboam stretched forth his hand and bade the bystanders seize the bold stranger. But at the moment, his hand became suddenly paralyzed, and at the same time the altar was rent asunder, and the ashes of the victims were poured out. Now thoroughly alarmed, the king implored the prophet to intercede with the Lord for him, that the heavy judgment he had incurred might be removed. The other complied, and the king's hand was restored. Grateful for this signal favor, Jeroboam would now have hospitably entertained the man of God, but the latter had been sent on a special errand, and his commands had been precise and peremptory, neither to eat bread nor drink water in a place so openly profaned with idolatry, nor even to return thence by the same road that he had come. Accordingly, he declined the royal invitation and went his way. 1 Kings 13 and verse 10. On the road, however, as he lingered under an oak, he was overtaken by an old prophet of Bethel, who had heard from his sons of the day's occurrences at the festival. His own guilty silence had well nigh made him a partaker in the sins of the king, and the bold bearing of the stranger reminded him of what he himself should have done. Either, therefore, from a wish to win respect for himself once more, by intercourse with such an accredited messenger of the Most High, or with the full intention of deceiving him, and so bringing discredit on his words, he hurried after him, and now announced himself as the bearer of a distinct divine command that he should return to Bethel. Overcome by this solemn declaration, the other accompanied him to the town. But as they were seated at the meal, the Spirit of the Lord came upon the guilty host, and the deceiver was constrained to pronounce the doom of the deceived. The man of God had been faithless to the terms of his commission, and a certain death awaited him, nor should his body ever come into the sepulchre of his fathers. With his doom upon him, he went his way, and a lion met and slew him. 1 Kings 8 verse 24 But though dead, he was yet to speak, and testify to the solemnity of the mission on which he had been sent. When he was found lying dead on the road, the lion also standing there, as well as the ass on which he had ridden, the beast of prey had not eaten the corpse nor torn the ass. Thus the mysterious circumstances of the prophet's death confirmed that sign of his authority, which he had weakened during his life. And the old prophet of Bethel, by laying him in his own sepulchre with all honour, and charging his sons after his death to bury him beside the victim of his own deceit, preserved in Jeroboam's new religious capital, a silent witness against the idolatries there practiced. 1 Kings 8, verses 30 to 32. End of Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 2 of a class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear, Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 2. Rehoboam and Abijah, Jeroboam and Nadab. 1 Kings 13 to 15, 2 Chronicles 11 to 13, BC 975 to 955. This warning, however, though confirmed by signs and wonders, had little or no effect on Jeroboam himself. He persisted in his evil courses, and his dynasty was destined to pass away, 
a fact before long revealed to him under very mournful circumstances. His son Abijah fell sick. In his anxiety to know the fate of the hope of his kingdom, Jeroboam bade his wife disguise herself and repair to Shiloh, and there consult the now blind and aged prophet who had foretold his own elevation to the throne. Though she was effectually disguised and presented only the gift of an ordinary person, a few loaves, some cakes and a cruise of honey, the prophet detected his visitor as soon as he heard the sound of her feet at the door and confirmed her worst fears. In words of utmost sternness, he denounced her husband's idolatries and distinctly told her that her son would die. He indeed, as one in whom was found some good things toward the Lord God of Israel, would descend into the grave mourned and lamented by the whole people. But no other of his family would thus receive an honourable funeral, and his death would be but the prelude of the destruction of his father's dynasty. With a heavy heart the mother returned, and as she entered the town of Terzar, Abijah sickened, and the blind prophet's words came true. 1 Kings 14, verses 1 to 18. Meanwhile, the relations between the rival kingdoms had been marked by continued hostility. 1 Kings 14, verse 30, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 15. The first step taken by Rehoboam when the disruption of the kingdom was complete was to fortify 15 cities in the neighborhood of his capital and in the southern and southwestern portions of Judah. 2 Chronicles 11, 5 through 12. All these he stored with provisions and arms and placed over them commandants. During the first three years of his reign, he walked in the ways of the Lord and was strengthened in upholding the principles of true religion by numerous bodies of priests and Levites who flocked into the territory of Judah from that of Jeroboam, as also by many of the tribes of Israel who still remained faithful to the Lord God of their fathers. Second Chronicles 11, 13-17 But soon, like Solomon before him, he too was found wanting. Surrounding himself with a numerous harem, He took eighteen wives and sixty concubines, by whom he became the father of numerous sons and daughters. Reserving the throne for Abijah, the son of Maaka, daughter of Absalom, he dispersed the rest of the royal princes among his fortified cities, and in the splendor of his court and the security of his now established throne, forgat the law of the Lord, 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 1, and set an evil example to his subjects who speedily began to build high places and set up images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. 1 Kings 14, verses 22-24 to 24. Five years, however, after his accession, his peace was rudely disturbed. Shishak, the Egyptian king, instigated probably by Jeroboam, whom, as we have already seen, he had befriended in exile, advanced against Judah with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 cavalry and an enormous host of Libyans, Nubians and Ethiopians. Having made himself master of Rehoboam's fenced cities, he penetrated as far as his capital and forced him to purchase an ignominious peace by delivering up the treasure of the royal palace and the temple, even to the shields of gold which Solomon had made for the purpose of being born before him whenever he visited the temple in state. 1 Kings 10, verses 16 and 17. More than this, the Egyptian monarch did not attempt, as Shemaiah the prophet had promised would be the case if the king and his people displayed signs of real contrition for their idolatries. After this deep humiliation, the moral condition of Judah seems to have improved, and the rest of Rehoboam's reign is not marked by any remarkable event. He died, B.C. 957, at the age of 58, after a reign of 17 years, and was succeeded by his son Abijah. The new king continued the war with Jeroboam and made a determined effort to recover the ten tribes. At Mount Zemaraim in the range of Ephraim, he confronted with 400,000 troops, twice that number of the enemy, and previously to the battle, endeavoured by a solemn address to win over the subjects of his rival to their former allegiance. He reminded them of the divine election of David to the throne of the entire nation. 
and the emphatic manner in which the monarchy had been covenanted to him. He recounted the circumstances under which Jeroboam had usurped the regal power and contrasted the idolatrous worship he had established with the time-honored ritual of the temple and its divinely ordained priests. While he thus sought to awaken the loyalty of the tribes, his rival had posted an ambuscade behind the men of Judah who found themselves entrapped. But, nothing daunted, they cried unto the Lord, and while the priests sounded with the silver trumpets, raised a shout and fell upon the foe. The forces of Jeroboam were utterly routed, and Abijah succeeded in capturing the towns of Bethel, Jeshanah, and Ephraim with the surrounding villages. From this signal defeat, the king of Israel never recovered strength again, Second Chronicles 13 verse 20, and soon after died, bequeathing his throne to his son Nadab, while his rival Abijah, after a brief reign of three years, also died, and was succeeded by his son Asa, B.C. 954. End of Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 2, recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 1. Chapter 3. Asa and Baasha, Elah, Zimri, and Omri. First Kings, chapters 15 and 16. Second Chronicles, chapters 14 to 16. B.C. 955 to 918. The reign of Nadab was very brief, lasting only two years. As he was besieging Gibbethon, a town allotted to Dan, Joshua 19, verse 44, and afterwards given to the Kohathite Levites, Joshua 21, verse 23, but which was now in the hands of the Philistines, Baasha, the son of Abijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and, usurping the throne, smote all the house of Jeroboam till he left none that breathed, thus fulfilling the words of Ahijah and destroying the first Israelitish dynasty, B.C. 953. Between the new king and Asa, Constant hostilities were maintained. The latter, mindful of the conditions on which he held the kingdom, no sooner ascended the throne than he commenced a general religious reform throughout his dominions. He removed the idols his father had set up, the high places, the images, and the groves, nor did he spare the idolatrous ritual even of his grandmother, Mayaka, who held the special dignity of Queen Mother. He removed the symbol of her religion, and flung the ashes into the brook Kidron. Having thus restored the worship of Jehovah to something of its former purity, he strengthened his kingdom by fortifying the frontier towns, and raised and equipped a large army. He was thus in a condition to confront the enormous host with which his realm was invaded by Zera the Ethiopian, probably Osorkon II, the successor of Shishak, and the inheritor of his quarrel with Rehoboam. The Egyptian host penetrated as far as Mirashah in the low country of Judah, where they were confronted by Asa, whose confidence in his God was rewarded by a complete victory, and the Egyptian host fell back routed as far as Gerar, leaving immense spoils in the hands of the men of Judah. Second Chronicles 14, verses 9 to 15. After this signal success, encouraged by the assurances of the prophet Azariah, Asa resolved to continue his religious reforms, and on his arrival at Jerusalem, convoked an assembly of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, as well as of the strangers sojourning amongst them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. And in the third month of the fifteenth year of his reign, renewed with solemn sacrifices a national covenant. With a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets, the assembly swore fealty to their God and King, and vowed to put to death all who proved unfaithful to Jehovah. Second Chronicles 15 verses 1 to 15 The peace which his kingdom now enjoyed, 
were soon disturbed by the hostility of Baasha, who marched against Asa, and having recovered the territory which he had lost, fortified Ramah, about six miles north of Jerusalem, not only to annoy his enemy and stop the tide of immigration from his own kingdom into that of Judah, but also to cut off Asa's communications with the central portion of Israel. On this, that monarch resolved to purchase the aid of the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad I, and persuade him to break off his alliance with his rival. Sending, therefore, all the silver and gold left in the treasuries of the temple to the Syrian monarch, he succeeded in inducing him to fling an army into northern Palestine, which smote Ejon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maacah, Sinaroth, and all the land of Naphtali. This forced Baasha to withdraw his forces and retire to Tuzar, whereupon Asa summoned all Judah, and having destroyed the works of Ramah, used the stones and timber to fortify two towers, Geba and Mizpah, as checks to any similar attempts in future. This is the first instance of a Hebrew king courting an alliance with a heathen power in a great crisis of the national fortunes, and it did not pass unnoticed by the prophetical order. Hanani the seer denounced such faithless leaning on an arm of flesh, and foretold that from henceforth he should have wars. The outspoken rebuke roused the anger of Asa. He flung the bold prophet into prison and oppressed some of the people, who probably sympathized in his denunciations. In other respects he had ruled his kingdom with energy, loyalty and piety, and after a severe attack of gout, died in the forty-first year of his reign, and was committed to the tomb amidst general sorrow, bequeathing his throne to his son Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles 16 verses 7 to 14, BC 914. Meanwhile, there had been great vicissitudes in the kingdom of Israel. After destroying the whole house of Jeroboam, Baasha made the beautiful city of Terzah his capital, and in spite of the warnings of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, 1 Kings 16 verses 1 through 7, persisted in walking in the ways of Jeroboam, wherewith he made Israel to sin. His reign of twenty-four years was chiefly distinguished by his persistent hostility to his rival Asa, which cost him, as we have seen, several cities in the northern part of his dominions, in consequence of Asa's alliance with Ben-Hadad. He was succeeded in the year BC 930 by his son Elah, who had barely reigned for the brief space of a year, when on the occasion of a riotous feast in the house of his steward at Terzah, he was assassinated by Zimri, the captain of half his chariots, B.C. 929. The usurper signalized his accession by ruthlessly murdering every member of the family of Baasha, but had barely occupied the throne for seven days when Omri, captain of the army then besieging Gibbethon, attacked him at Terzah. Despairing of aid, Zimri anticipated the wishes of his rival by firing the place over his head and perished in the flames. But the claims of the usurper to his blood-stained throne were not universally acknowledged. Half the people sided with him, and half with another aspirant, Tibni, the son of Ginnath. 1 Kings 16 verse 21 For five years the latter reigned as rival king, and the land was desolated with civil discord. At length, the faction of Omri prevailed, and Tibni, dying, he became sole king of Israel and founder of its third dynasty. For six years he made Terzah, though now in ruins, his capital, and then in spite of its proverbial beauty, Song of Solomon 6 and verse 4, determined to remove his residence elsewhere. About six miles northwest of Shechem was an oval-shaped, isolated hill, rising by successive terraces 600 feet above the surrounding plateau, and combining in union not elsewhere found in Palestine, strength, beauty, and fertility. This hill Omri purchased of Shema, its owner, for two talents of silver, and on its long flat top built a city, which instead of naming after himself, he called after the name of its owner, Shomron, the city of Shema afterwards corrupted into the Kaldi Shemrin and thence into the Greek Samaria. In his new capital, Omri reigned six years more. A vigorous and unscrupulous ruler, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord more than all his predecessors on the throne. 
He not only courted an alliance with ben the I and surrendered to him some border towns, 1 Kings 20 verse 34, and admitted a resident Syrian embassy into Samaria, but gave his son and successor Ahab in marriage to Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of Zidon, 1 Kings 16 verse 31, thus introducing the worship of Baal as the recognized religion of his kingdom. End of Book 10, Part 1, Chapter 3 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mason Lewis a Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Book 10, Part 2 Period of Mutual Alliance and Hostility to Syria Chapter 1 Reign of Ahab, Era of Elijah 1 Kings 17-19, through 2 Chronicles 17 B.C. 918-915 to The first act of Jehoshaphat, who succeeded Asa on the throne of Judah, was to fortify and garrison the fenced cities in his dominions, as well as the towns in Ephraim, which his father had captured. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 2. With much zeal for the national faith, he next endeavored to put down the high places and groves, and sent a commission of princes, priests, and Levites to traverse the various towns and instruct the people out of the book of the law. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 6 through 9. His pious zeal did not go unrewarded. The Lord established the kingdom in his hand and gave him peace round about. Not only his own subjects, but even the Philistines and Arabians brought him tribute. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 5 and 11, which enabled him to build castles and store cities in Judah and maintain a large standing army. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 12 through 19. Meanwhile, very different scenes were enacted in the rival kingdom of Israel. Ithobalus, or Ethbal, the father of Ahab's queen, had once been a priest of the Phoenician goddess Astarte, and had usurped the throne of his brother Phales. Jezebel inherited the spirit of her father, and quickly acquired the most unbounded influence over her weak-minded husband, so that he became a mere puppet in her hands. The first effect of her influence was the establishment of the worship of Baal on the most extensive scale. Near the palace at Samaria rose a temple in honor of this Phoenician deity, and an oracular grove, while 450 of the prophets of Baal and 400 of Astarte were supported at the queen's table. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31 and 32, chapter 18, verse 19. She also resolved that a worship, now formally legalized, should be forcibly imposed on her husband's subject, and so great was her severity towards the prophets of Jehovah that they were constrained to conceal themselves in caves and there eke out a precarious existence. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 13. While she thus persecuted the servants of Jehovah, her yielding husband occupied himself chiefly with indulging a taste for splendid architecture. He erected several cities and built an ivory palace, and while Samaria remained his capital, sought another Tirzah in the beautiful city of Jezreel, the very name of which, the seed plot of God, indicates the fertility of the neighborhood. In this crisis of the Israelitish kingdom came forth, sudden as the lightning, alarming as the thunder, one of the most remarkable men that Israel ever produced. From the wooded uplands across the Jordan, from the country of the rude soldier judge Jephthah, clad in the austere garb of the prophets, consisting of a girdle of skin hanging round his loins, and a sheepskin mantle, his hair long and thick, and hanging down his back, Second Kings chapter 1 verse 18, appeared in the palace of Ahab. Elijah the Tishbite, of the inhabitants of Gilead. Without a word of comment or introduction, he announced in the name of that God, whom the monarch had insulted, a speedy and awful judgment. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, said he, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Having thus boldly delivered his message, he fled for his life to the brook or torrent bed of the Cherith, either amongst his own native hills, or on the west of Jordan and nearer to Samaria. Here he was for some time miraculously supported by ravens, which brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, while he drank of the water of the brook. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 through 7. After a while, the slender streamlet was dried up. 
Guided by the divine direction, the prophet now repaired to Zarephath, or Sarepta, Luke chapter 4, verse 25 through 29, a Phoenician village on the seashore between Tyre and Sidon, and in the very midst of Phoenician heathenism. As he drew nigh the place, he met the widow, with whom he was to lodge, gathering sticks. Though she was so poverty-stricken that she had but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise, and the sticks she was gathering were to make a last meal for her child and herself before they died, he yet bade her to make a little cake for him first, and assured her that the barrel of meal should not waste, nor the cruise of oil fail, till the rain returned. Strong in faith, the woman did as he bade her, and found his words true. For a full year, First Kings chapter 17, verse 15, margin, she and her house did eat, nor did their supplies fail. But before long, a sore trouble visited her home. Her son sickened and seemed at the point of death. In the agony of her grief, she imputed this trial to the presence of the mysterious prophet. But Elijah took the boy up to his chamber and laid him on his own bed. Then he stretched himself three times upon him and cried mightily to the Lord that his life might be restored to him. His prayer was heard. The soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And the prophet restored him to his mother, who is now convinced that her guest was a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in his mouth was true. First Kings chapter 17, verse 8 through 24. Meanwhile, the kingdom of Israel was suffering the most grievous extremities from the prolonged drought. The earth lay cracked and parched and barren. Sheep, cattle, horses perished from want of water and from the failure of the crops. So great was the destitution that Ahab left his luxurious palace at Samaria and divided with Obadiah, his chief domestic officer, and who, at the peril of his life, remained faithful in his allegiance to Jehovah, the duty of examining every spring and nook of the most shaded torrent bed to discover any sign of herbage, wherewith to save the horses and mules alive that they might not lose all the beast. While well, then Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself, suddenly the latter discerned the prophet standing in the midst of the path. At the divine command, Elijah had left his retreat at Zarephath, and now bade the minister of Ahab to announce his master his own return. At first Obadiah demurred. He feared lest, while he had gone on this mission, the Spirit of the Lord might summon the prophet in some other direction, and the king would slay him in his disappointment. But Elijah reassured him, and he went and told Ahab, and Ahab went to meet the servant of Jehovah. Few but pointed were the prophet's words, when he was confronted with the weak woman-governed king. After sternly denouncing his idolatries, he commanded him to summon instantly to the top of Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. Awed by the bearing of the seer, the monarch dared not disobey, and the prophets, followed by a large concourse of people, repaired to the appointed spot at the extreme eastern point of the Long Carmel Range, commanding the last view of the sea behind and the first view of the great plain in front. It was the crisis in the history of the ten tribes. On that day it was to be proved, once for all, who was supreme, Baal or Jehovah. With his one attendant, Elijah proceeded to the place of controversy and proposed to the assembled multitudes a decisive test. Let two bullocks be chosen. Let one of them be slain by the priests of Baal and cut in pieces. Let these be laid upon an altar with no fire under. Let them then call upon the name of their gods, and the god that answered by fire let him be God. The challenge was accepted. The altar was built, the victim slain, the pieces laid in order, and the priests of Baal commenced their incantations. But there was no voice, neither any that answered. Morning passed, and noon came, and still there was no reply. Meanwhile, Elijah suggested to them that they should cry aloud, for, said he, with cutting irony, he is a god. Either he meditateth, or he is pursuing, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. Stung to the quick, the priests redoubled their invocations. They cried aloud, they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. But prayers, cries, lacerations were each and all in vain. First Kings chapter 18, verse 1 through 30. The hour for the evening sacrifice now drew near, and Elijah bade the people approach, and with twelve stones, according to the number of tribes of Jacob, repaired an ancient altar on the mountain top, which Jezebel probably had caused to be thrown down. Round about it, he next caused a trench to be dug, and having slain his victim, laid it upon the altar. Then once, twice, and yet again, he caused victim and altar to be drenched with water, till it filled even the trench. 
This done, the solitary prophet poured forth his whole soul to the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, praying him that he would that day prove that he was indeed the Lord, and that he himself had done all these things at his word. His prayer was answered. The fire of the Lord descended and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up even the water that was in the trench. The effect on the people was profound. Falling upon their faces, they with one accord confessed Jehovah. He is the God. Jehovah. He is the God. First Kings chapter 18, verse 30 through 39. It was the moment for still more decisive measures. Elijah had bowed the hearts of the people as one man. Take the prophets of Baal, he cried. Let not one of them escape. And down the steep sides of the mountain they were brought to the level plain below, where flowed the Kishon. There these troublers of the nation's peace were slain, and the stern act of duty done, the prophet bade the king accompany him up the mountain to join in a sacrificial feast. Then, while Ahab ate and drank, he himself ascended to a higher level, and on the bare ground, with his face between his knees, remained wrapped in prayer, having bidden his servant ascend yet higher, and look towards the blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Six times he came back to his master with the announcement that he could see nothing. But the seventh time he returned, saying, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. It was the long-desired sign, the first that had for days and months passed across the heavens, telling of the coming rain. Instantly the prophet bade the king descend the mountain, prepare his chariot, and make for his palace. The king obeyed, and meantime the little cloud had grown and overcast the whole evening sky. Soon a wind arose and shook the forest of Carmel, and the welcome rain poured down in torrents. Across the bed of Kishon, Ahab urged his chariot along the road to Jezreel, while Elijah, girding up his loins and tightening his hairy mantle about him, ran before the chariot of his sovereign at least sixteen miles to the entrance of the city. Thus far the triumph of the prophet was complete, but now when victory seemed to be in the hollow of his hand, at the most critical moment of his life, his courage failed him. Jezebel, informed of what had taken place on Carmel, sent a messenger threatening him with certain death, and Elijah, who had boldly defied multitudes on Carmel, fled before the face of a woman, in a southerly direction towards Beersheba. There he left his attendant and went alone a day's journey into the waste, uninhabited country, which borders on the south of Palestine. Weary, disappointed, he requested that he might die, and flinging himself under a juniper tree, fell asleep. Presently, an angel awoke him, and pointing to a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water, bade him refresh himself, and in the strength of that meat, go still further southward, to Horeb, the mountain of God. Arrived there, he remained at least one night in the, one of the caverns of the awful mountain range, and in the morning heard the word of the Lord inquiring, what doest thou here, Elijah? In reply, the prophet urged his eminent services for the cause of Jehovah. The children of Israel had forsaken the covenant, thrown down the Lord's altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. He alone was left, and they sought his life to take it away. In this dejected, murmuring mood, he was not fit to discharge the duties of his office. The Lord therefore bade him to leave his cave and stand before him face to face upon the mountains, while he passed by in all the terror of his most appalling manifestations. First, a mighty rushing wind rent the solid mountain and break in pieces the cliffs of Sinai, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then an earthquake shook the rocks, and the mountain trembled with the crash, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then a fire blazed forth and burnt with a consuming heat, but the Lord was not in the fire. Then all was quiet, the convulsion of nature was hushed, and presently there came a still, small voice. And as Elijah listened, his face wrapped in his mantle, he learnt that there was yet something left for him to do, that he was not the only instrument the Lord could employ. He was to return and anoint Hazael king over Syria, Jehu son of Nimshi king of Israel, and Elisha of abel Mehalah, as his successor in the prophetical office. And whereas he had complained that he was the only faithful servant of Jehovah, he now learnt that the Lord had left him seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which had not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which had not kissed him. First Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18. End of Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 1. Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Mason Lewis. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 2. Wars of Ahab and Ben-Hadad. 1 Kings 20, B.C. 901. Of the three commands thus laid upon him, Elijah straightway proceeded to execute the last. From Horeb he journeyed to Abel Meholah, the meadow of the dance, in the northern part of the Jordan Valley. Here he met Elisha, the son of Shaphat, apparently a man of substance, plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. Casting his well-known mantle upon him, the prophet, by this symbolic action, claimed him as his son, and called him to follow him. Lingering only to bid farewell to his father and mother, and to celebrate a parting feast with his people, Elisha arose and hurried after the great prophet, and became henceforth his constant attendant. Meanwhile, Ahab, while he retained Samaria as the capital of his kingdom, adorned with a palace and park the beautiful city of Jezreel, in the Esdraelon plain. But ere long this and other instances of his passion for splendid architecture received a rude check. At the head of a large army, and aided by thirty-two vassal kings, Ben-Hadad II, king of Syria, laid siege to Samaria. While this was in progress, with true oriental haughtiness, he made a formal demand of all the silver and gold, the wives and children belonging to his enemy. Hoping to disarm hostility, the servile Ahab replied by a promise of faithful vassalage to the lord of Syria. But Ben-Hadad, emboldened by this weak compliance, sent ambassadors with the announcement that on the following day he should enforce his demand by an actual search of Ahab's palace. Even the king of Israel was stung to the quick by this insulting message, and summoning all the elders of his kingdom, he laid the matter before them. It was resolved to defend Samaria at all risks, and Ben-Hadad was informed that his demand could not be entertained. On receiving this reply, the king of Syria sent another message to declare his intention of laying Samaria level with the ground. Tell him, rejoined Ahab, let not him that girdeth on his armor boast himself as he that putteth it off. A spirited reply, which filled Ben-Hadad with rage, and he ordered preparations to be made for an instant assault. At this juncture, a prophet stood forth and assured Ahab of a complete victory over the vast host of his enemy, which should be achieved by a mere handful of men. In accordance with his suggestion, the king thereupon numbered the 232 attendants on the princes of the provinces, and prepared to send them against the Syrian camp, while 7,000 of the regular troops followed behind. The little band left the gates of Samaria and proceeded towards the pavilions, or rather the tents and booths of branches, boughs, and brushwood, which were erected for the Syrian chiefs in the camp, as they are still erected for the Turkish pashas and agas in their expeditions. Though it was only high noon, Ben-Hadad, with his vassal chiefs, was carousing over his wine cups. But he no sooner heard of the approach of the little band from the city, than with drunken insolence he ordered that they should be taken alive, whether they came for peace or war. The force, however, sent to execute this order, found it no easy one, for the 232 princes of the provinces offered a strenuous resistance, and struck down all who opposed them. This, and the sight of the 7,000 following behind, filled the Syrian host with a sudden panic, and they fled precipitately, headed by Ben-Hadad himself on a fleet horse, and pursued by the victorious Israelites, who inflicted upon them a great slaughter. 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 1-22 through 22. Thus Samaria was delivered. But the same prophet who had predicted the victory now warned Ahab to be on his guard. For with the return of spring, the enemy would renew the invasion, which duly came to pass. Annoyed at their late humbling defeat, the Syrians had concluded that it was owing to the fact that they had attacked in a hilly region a people whose gods were gods of the hills. They now resolved to fight in a more level region, and in place of the vassal kings, who probably had been the first to fly in the late battle, they had substituted captains and mustered an army as large as the last. Accordingly, at the season named by the prophet, they advanced with a vast host to Aphek, a town in the level country east of the Jordan, on the military road from Syria to Israel. Hither the army of Ahab went forth to meet them, and encamped, appearing like two little flocks of kids, in comparison of their formidable foes who filled the country round. But again a prophet appeared to encourage Ahab, and assure him of a second victory. The Syrians had imagined Jehovah to be merely a god of the hills. They should know that he was a god also of the valleys. 
1 Kings chapter 20, verse 28. For seven days the two armies confronted one another, and then the battle was joined. The Syrians were utterly routed and fled in confusion to Aphek, resolved there to make a stand. But the wall of the town, in consequence probably of a sudden earthquake, fell with a terrible crash and buried upwards of 27,000 in the ruins. ben himself, with his immediate attendants, escaped, and was advised by them to throw himself on the mercy of the conqueror. They proposed to go forth with sackcloth on their loins and ropes on their heads and plead for their lives. Mounted in his chariot, Ahab received the envoys, inquired after the welfare of his late dreaded enemy, and called him his brother. The word brother revived the courage of the Syrian ambassadors, and they were presently bidden to return and usher their master into Ahab's presence. Ben-Hadad came and was invited to take his place in the chariot by the side of his conqueror. Grateful for this unexpected clemency, he promised to restore to the king of Israel all the towns his father had taken from the Israelites, and to permit his subjects to have a quarter in the Syrian capital, similar to that which Ben-Hadad's father had obtained in Samaria. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 34. This impolitic clemency to an unrelenting national foe was sternly rebuked by one of the sons of the prophets. Having caused himself to be wounded and disguised with a headband, he awaited Ahab's coming along the road, and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the late battle, and behold, a man turned aside, and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. Instantly Ahab decided the matter, and pronounced that he must bear the penalty. On this the headband was removed, and the king perceived not only that the speaker was a scholar of the prophets, but understood also the true meaning of his parable. Because he had spared a man, whom Jehovah had devoted to utter destruction, the punishment should fall upon him and his people, which he had failed to execute on Ben-Hadad. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 35 through 43. End of Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 2. Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 3. Murder of Naboth. Battle of Ramoth Gilead, First Kings chapters twenty one and twenty two, Second Chronicles chapter eighteen, BC eight ninety eight. Shortly after these events, an incident occurred which brought down upon Ahab and his house an awful doom. Adjoining his palace at Jezreel was a vineyard belonging to a native of the place named Naboth. Eagerly desirous to add the vineyard to his palace grounds and convert it into a garden of herbs, Ahab proposed to his owner to purchase it or give him in exchange another and even better piece of ground. This Naboth stoutly refused to do, alleging his unwillingness to part with the inheritance of his fathers. Leviticus 25 verse 23, Numbers 36 verse 8. Annoyed at this rebuff, the king returned to his palace and in his vexation flung himself on his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no bread. While in this mood he was visited by Jezebel, to whom he explained the cause of his vexation. She instantly resolved to take the matter into her own hands, and bade her lord trouble himself no more, she would give him the vineyard. Thereupon she wrote a warrant in Ahab's name, sealed it with his seal, and sent it to the elders of the city, directing that, as if on the occasion of some great calamity, a solemn fast should be proclaimed, that two men should be set up to charge Naboth with blasphemy against God and the king, and that then he should be stoned to death. Exodus 22 verse 28, Leviticus 24 verses 15 and 16. It is a striking proof of the degeneracy of the nation at this period, that the elders of Jezreel never for one moment scrupled about carrying out this inhuman order. Naboth was dragged forth, 
arraigned, condemned, and stoned together with his sons. See Second Kings 9 verse 26. And the elders reported to the queen that the guilt of blasphemy against Jehovah and his anointed had been avenged. The vineyard had now lapsed to the crown, and Jezebel bade her lord to go down and take possession of it. But on proceeding thither, the king found himself confronted by no other than the great Elijah, who in words of utmost sternness denounced the late cruel murder and declared the sentence of the Lord. The king and all his house should share the fate of Jeroboam and of Baasha. His queen should be eaten by the dogs at the wall of Jezreel, and dogs should lick up his own blood on the very spot where they had licked up that of Naboth. Appalled at this awful sentence, Ahab rent his clothes, put on sackcloth, fasted, and displayed all the signs of a sincere repentance. Such as it was, it was accepted, and Elijah was bidden to announce to him that the punishment should not be inflicted during his own lifetime, but in his son's days it would surely descend upon his house. 1 Kings 21 verse 29 Meanwhile, the relations between the rival kingdoms of Israel and Judah had been more peaceful than at any other period since they had parted sixty years before at Shechem. Not only were hostilities laid aside, but an alliance between the sovereigns was cemented by the marriage of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, with Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Moreover, about the sixteenth year of his reign, B.C. 898, the king of Judah went on a visit to the court of Israel. He was received with every mark of distinction, and Ahab slew sheep and oxen in abundance for him and his retinue. Second Chronicles 18 verse 2 During this visit, the king of Israel took occasion to propose to his ally that they should undertake an expedition for the purpose of recovering Ramoth Gilead, a strong fastness and the key to an important district east of Jordan, which Ben-Hadad I had wrested from Omri. Jehoshaphat expressed his willingness to take part in the expedition, but proposed that the will of Jehovah should first be ascertained. For this purpose, Ahab summoned about 400 of the prophets of his kingdom, who all advised him to go up, and assured him that the Lord would deliver the place into his hands. 1 Kings 22 verse 6 But this did not satisfy the king of Judah. He inquired if there was not a true prophet of Jehovah, at whose mouth they might seek counsel. Ahab confessed that there was one, Micaiah, the son of Imla, but openly avowed that he hated him, because he never predicted good to him, but only evil. Jehoshaphat, however, overruled the objection, and Micaiah was summoned from his prison, where he had been confined by Ahab, probably for some disagreeable prediction. Meanwhile, the two kings, arrayed in their royal robes, sat at the entrance of Samaria, and the four hundred prophets standing before them persisted in their predictions of success. One of them, Zedekiah, the son of Canaana, even made him horns of iron, and by this symbolic action assured the kings that they would push the Syrians till they had destroyed them. But Micaiah had the courage to differ from all. At first, indeed, he ironically assured the king of success. But when Ahab adjured him to speak the truth, he boldly affirmed that the prophets in whom he trusted were all filled with lying spirits and that he was destined to fall in the campaign. This outspoken declaration brought down upon the faithful seer the mockery and scorn of the other prophets and still greater severity from Ahab, who ordered him to be sent back to the city jail and there fed on the scantiest fare. 1 Kings 22 verse 27 then the two kings set out on the expedition, and on crossing the Jordan found that Ben-Hadad and his vassal princes were prepared to contest the possession of Ramoth. On this Ahab, the more surely to ward off a fate he too clearly divined, disguised himself while the king of Judah went into battle in his royal robes. The contest began, and the thirty-two captains of Ben-Hadad, acting on instructions they had received, bent all their efforts to slay Jehoshaphat, whom they mistook for the king of Israel. But his voice convinced them that he was not the man they sought, and they desisted from the pursuit. In spite, however, of his disguise, Ahab could not escape his doom. A certain man drew a bow at a venture, 
and the arrow pierced the joints of his breastplate. That the troops might not be discouraged, he was kept upstanding in his chariot till the evening, when he died. From the battlefield the corpse was then borne to Samaria, and there interred, while the bloody chariot was washed in the pool of the city, beside which Naboth and his sons had been murdered. Without a shepherd, and without a master, the people were scattered abroad, and returned home defeated before their enemies, and the words of Elijah, 1 Kings 21 verse 19, and of Micaiah, 22 verse 17, were fulfilled. End of Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 3 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 4 of a class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 4, Wars of Jehoshaphat, Translation of Elijah. 2 Kings chapters 1 and 2, 2 Chronicles chapters 19 and 20, B.C. 896. On his return from a campaign in which he had so nearly lost his life, Jehoshaphat was sternly rebuked by one of the prophets, 2 Chronicles 19 verse 2, for the guilty alliance he had formed with the court of Israel, and he resolved henceforth to devote himself to the spiritual and temporal welfare of his own subjects. Accordingly, he went on a second personal tour through his dominions from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and strove to reclaim his people to the worship of Jehovah. He also provided for the better administration of justice, placed judges in all the fenced cities and remodeled the tribunals in his capital. He next turned his attention to foreign commerce and at Easy on Geba constructed a fleet for the purpose of trading in gold with Ophir. In this project he was aided by Ahaziah, who had succeeded Ahab on the throne of Israel. But the unfortunate issue of the enterprise determined him to decline the proposal of his ally that the attempt should be renewed. Second Chronicles 20 verse 37, 1 Kings 22 verses 49 and 50. The remainder of his reign was not, however, destined to be peaceful. A vast host of the people of Moab, Ammon and Edom invaded his territory and encamped at Hazazon Tamar or Engedi. In his alarm, Jehoshaphat proclaimed a solemn fast throughout his kingdom, assembled all Judah together with their wives and their children, and offered up a pathetic petition for the divine aid. He had hardly concluded when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, a Levite, and one of the sons of Asaph, then in attendance at the temple, commissioning him to assure the pious king of a victory on the morrow, which he would only need to stand still and see. A psalm of thanksgiving was straightway sung, and on the morrow the army, preceded by choirs of Levites, left the holy city, and at about twelve hours' distance from Jerusalem, came to the uneven tableland of Tekoa, Tekoa, abounding in hidden caverns, cliffs, and excavations, where David and his men had often hidden during the period of his wanderings. It was not a locality adapted to the sons of the desert, and the ambushments for which it afforded so much opportunity sadly galled their wild hordes, and the children of Ammon and Moab turned their swords against their allies from Mount Seir, and then fell upon one another. On reaching the watchtower of Tekoa, the warriors of Judah beheld only a mass of dead bodies, and busied themselves for three days in stripping them of their rich ornaments, and gathering up the riches and jewels they had flung away in their hasty flight. Four days afterwards, a psalm of thanksgiving once more ascended to Jehovah from the valley of Barakak, blessing, and the army of Jehoshaphat returned in triumph to Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 20, verses 26-28 to 28. Meanwhile, Ahaziah, during his short and troubled reign over Israel, began to feel the effects of the late disastrous campaign against Ramoth Gilead. The Syrians, now masters of the country east of the Jordan, cut off all communication between his realm and his vassal, the king of Moab. 
The latter therefore rebelled against Israel and refused to send his yearly tribute of 100,000 lambs and 100,000 rams, 2 Kings 3 and verse 4. Before he could take measures for punishing this revolt, Ahaziah fell through a lattice in his palace at Samaria and sustained much injury. A devotee to the Phoenician idolatries of his mother, he sent messengers to the Philistine city of Ekron to inquire of the oracle of Baalzebub, the lord of flies, whether he should recover. On their road thither, the messengers encountered Elijah, who after reproaching them for consulting a heathen deity instead of Jehovah, announced that their master would never leave his bed alive. Returning, they informed Ahaziah of this occurrence, who inquired what kind of man they had met. Their answer was decisive. In the hairy man, girt with a girdle of leather about his loins, the king recognized all too clearly his father's enemy, and, ill as he was, this only served to kindle his wrath. Dispatching a captain with fifty men to the recesses of Carmel, where the prophet seems to have taken up his abode, he demanded his instant surrender. The soldier went and found Elijah seated on the mountain. Man of God, said he, the king hath said, come down. If I be a man of God, replied the other, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty men. With the word, the fire descended and consumed the captain and his fifty. A similar force was then a second time dispatched by the king, and they too met the same fate. A third captain, in an altered tone, implored the prophet to come down, and Elijah, assured by God of safety, descended and followed him into the presence of the king and announced in person his approaching end. Shortly after which Ahaziah died and was succeeded by his brother Jehoram. Second Kings 1 verses 2 to 17 This was the last time Elijah confronted any of the family of Ahab. Once only is he recorded to have expostulated with any of the house of Judah. Hearing that the son of Jehoshaphat, who seems to have been entrusted with a portion of the regal power during his father's lifetime, was not walking in his father's ways, but in those of Ahab and the kings of Israel, he sent a letter to him, denounced his idolatries and threatened him with sore judgments. Second Chronicles 21 verses 12 to 15 Shortly afterwards, though how soon is not certain, he received intimation of his approaching removal from the earth. From Gilgal, probably somewhere on the western edge of the hills of Ephraim, accompanied by Elisha, whom he had vainly tried to persuade to remain behind, he proceeded to Bethel. There the two were met by certain of the sons of the prophets, who also had been warned of what was at hand, and now inquired of Elisha if he knew of the loss he was about to sustain. Elisha replied that he did, but bade them hold their peace. Having again vainly tried to induce his faithful attendant to remain at Bethel, the prophet repaired to Jericho, where another company from the prophetic school warned his companion and were similarly enjoined to keep silence. From Jericho the two then held on their way towards the Jordan, while fifty of the sons of the prophets ascended the abrupt heights behind the city, which commanded a view of the plain below, to watch what would occur. Arrived at the river's brink, Elijah took off his prophetic mantle, and, wrapping it together, smote the waters which divided hither and thither, and the two went over on dry ground. Once on the other side, the prophet was within the borders of his native land, and he now inquired of his companion what he should do for him before he was taken away. The other asked for a double portion of his spirit. He had asked a hard thing, but still, if he looked steadfastly on his master while he was taken from him, he was told that his request should be granted, but not otherwise. Still conversing, the two then walked on, till suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire parted them asunder, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. With a great and bitter cry, Elisha called after him as he ascended, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. But he was gone, and he saw him no more. In token of grief, he thereupon rent his clothes, and taking up the mantle of his master, went back, and once more stood by the banks of the Jordan. Then wrapping the mantle, even as he had seen the other do, 
he smote, saying, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the waters again parted hither and thither, and he went over. Meanwhile, the sons of the prophets who had stood watching saw him coming towards Jericho, going down to meet him, bowed themselves to the ground before him. Contrary to his advice, they then insisted on sending fifty strong men to search for Elijah, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord had taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. For three days the search was continued, but they found him not. The work of the most wonderful character Israel ever produced was over, and he had been summoned to another world. 2 Kings 2 verses 11 to 18 End of Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 4 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 8, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Todd Manning, Raleigh, North Carolina. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 8, Chapter 6, David's Life as an Outlaw. 1 Samuel 18-23, through B.C. 1063-1061. through The victory over Goliath was the turning point in David's life. He was now no longer the obscure shepherd of Bethlehem, but the recognized deliverer of Israel and the chief of Saul's men of war. 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. Moreover, he now became the devoted friend of Jonathan, the king's son. The hero of Michmash would naturally sympathize with the daring shepherd of Bethlehem, and his soul was knit with the soul of David. 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, compare 2 Samuel number 1, verse 26. The two ratified a solemn vow of undying friendship, and Jonathan bestowed on his newfound friend almost every article of his attire, not only his costly robe that he wore, but even his sword, his bow, and his girdle. 1 Samuel 18, verse 4. But the hour of David's triumph was the signal for the commencement of those embittered relations which subsisted between him and Saul till the day of the latter's death. As the royal party returned from the valley of Elah, they were met by companies of Hebrew maidens, who in their songs expressed the discerning feelings of the nation, singing, Saul hath slain thousands, and David his ten thousands. To the king, this was gall and wormwood. In the youthful warrior, he saw that other more worthy than himself, for whom the kingdom was designed, and he eyed him from that day forward, 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 9. As the king's armor-bearer, David did not neglect his musical talents, and when Saul's fits of madness were upon him, he soothed him with the strains of his harp. But more than once he did so at the peril of his life, for in a sudden paroxysm of rage, the king flung at him the long spear he held in his hand, and would have pinned him to the wall had he not escaped out of his presence. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 11. Perceiving that the divine favor was withdrawn from himself, Saul now became afraid of David, and in hope of getting rid of him, gave him the command of a thousand men. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 13. And sent him on several expeditions. But David's uniform success and the prudence he displayed only won for him still more the favor of the people. The king then tried other expedients. He promised him his eldest daughter Merib in marriage, on condition that he fought against the Philistines. David went, and instead of falling in battle, only covered himself with fresh glory. But when the time for marriage came, Merib was given to another. 1 Samuel, verse 18, number 19. Meanwhile, Michal, the king's second daughter, had fallen in love with her father's armor-bearer. As if to bring his previous designs to positive fulfillment, Saul named as her dowry proof that David had slain a hundred of the Philistines. At the head of his men, David went, and slew twice that number, and brought the required proofs of their death. 
The marriage was celebrated, and David became captain of the royal bodyguard, second only, if not equal, to Abner. But the king's jealousy of his successful rival was only the more increased, and he went so far as to propose to Jonathan and his servants that David should be put out of the way, and was only dissuaded by the moving intercession of Jonathan himself. A partial reconciliation with the king ensued, and David returned to court. But his life was not more secure. On one occasion, his own vigilance in eluding the royal javelin. On another, the devotion of his wife Michelle alone saved his life. On the last occasion, the officers charged to put him to death had actually penetrated into his chamber, but only to find in the bed, in place of the object of their search, an image, or household god, with the head enveloped in a net of goat's hair. During the night his wife had let him down from the window. Compare Psalms 59. David now fled away to Nioth, the huts or habitations near Ramah, where he enjoyed a brief respite from danger and anxiety in the congenial society of the aged Samuel, whom he had not seen since the occurrence of Bethlehem, and of the company of prophets there gathered together under his superintendence. News of his hiding place reached the ears of Saul, who forthwith sent messengers to take him. But the sight of the prophets performing their sacred functions under the eye of the venerable Samuel, and their strains of sacred melody, so wrought upon the messengers, that they could not refrain from joining their religious exercises. A similar issue attended a second and even a third deputation. At length Saul went in person to the great well or cistern of Shishu, not far from Rama, and inquired for the prophet and the fugitive. But as he drew near the place, he himself could not resist the prophetic impulse, and for the second time justified the inquiry. Is Saul also among the prophets? 1 Samuel, verse 19, number 24. Thus the danger was for the time averted. But this state of suspense was intolerable, and David felt there was but a step between him and death. Probably by Samuel's advice, he now obtained a secret interview with Jonathan at Ezel, a well-known stone near Gibeah. In pathetic language, he poured out his whole soul to his friend and besought him to make an effort to ascertain once and for all the real feelings of his father, which he might think had undergone a change after the incidents at Nioth. The morrow was a festival of the new moon. Saul would hold a solemn feast, and at his table would sit Abner and Jonathan. But David's place would be vacant. The demeanor of the king on observing his absence was to be taken as an omen. If he acquiesced in Jonathan's explanation that David was absent at a similar festival under the family roof at Bethlehem, all would be well. If he was wroth, then it would be certain that the old grudge was not healed and that evil was determined against him. A solemn compact was then ratified between the two. Jonathan undertook to ascertain his father's mind. David promised to shew kindness not only to Jonathan himself, but to all his posterity. 1 Samuel, verse 20, numbers 5 through 10. When this compact had been duly ratified, Jonathan suggested an expedient whereby the news was made known to David. Within three days he would again repair to the great stone with his bow and arrows, and accompanied by a little lad. He would then shoot three arrows, as though he shot at a mark, and his words to the lad, which David would overhear, must decide the point. If he said to the lad, Behold, arrows are on the side of thee, take them, then David might come forth and know that all was well. If he said, The arrows are beyond thee, then he might go his way, certain that the wrath of the king could not be appeased. The day came, and David repaired to his hiding place. In due time, Jonathan and his little lad appeared, and the three arrows were shot as agreed upon. And as the lad ran to pick them up, he cried, Is not the arrow beyond thee? Then David knew that he must fly, and when the lad was gone to carry back the bow and arrows to Gibeah, rose from his hiding place, and with passionate embraces and many tears parted from his friend, who once more commended his posterity to his care. 1 Samuel, verse 20, numbers 35 through 42. David now betook himself to Nob, a sacerdotal city in the tribe of Benjamin, and situated on an eminence near Jerusalem. 
Here the high priest Amalek resided with the tabernacle and trembled when he saw the captain general of the royal troops approaching alone and unattended by his usual retinue. But David disarmed his suspicions by pretending a secret mission from the king and in this character obtained in the future of other bread the sacred loaves of shoe bread, which having served their turn in the weekly course were about to be replaced by new loaves. With these and the sword of Goliath, which was brought forth from its receptacle behind the ephod, he fled away, resolved to seek refuge amongst his enemies, the Philistines. On his arrival at the court of Achish, king of Gath, he was recognized by the royal guards as the famous champion of Israel, and the sword he carried doubtless recalled bitter memories of the Valley of Elah. He was accordingly thrown into prison, but in this dilemma he changed his behavior, scrabbled on the doors of the gates, let his spittle fall upon his beard, and gave every sign of being insane. The oriental respect for madness procured him his release, and he was suffered to depart. From the lowlands of the Philistines, he now betook himself to the town of Adullam. Joshua verse 15, number 35. At the foot of the mountain range of Judea, and found a secure retreat in one of the extensive caves, with which the limestone cliffs of the neighborhood are pierced. News of his coming reached Bethlehem. 1 Samuel, verse 22, number 1. And straight away his brethren and all his father's house, feeling perhaps insecure from Saul's vengeance, came down to his stronghold from the Judean hills. These probably included his nephews, the sons of Zeruiah, Job, and Abishai, but besides these were four hundred men who joined him from various motives, some from distress, others to avoid exacting creditors, others from some private sorrow. Not considering, however, his aged father and mother secure even in the secluded spot, David hastily crossed the Jordan and conveyed them into the friendly territory of Moab, and there consigned them to the king who agreed to protect them. 1 Samuel, verse 32, numbers 3 and 4. By the advice of his friend, the prophet Gad, he now retired to the forest of Hereth, not far from Adullam. It was probably while he was here, in hold, that the sons of Zeruiah, performed the memorable exploit recorded in 2 Samuel, verse 23, numbers 14 through 17, 1 Chronicles, verse 21, numbers 16 through 19. A garrison of the Philistines had established themselves even in David's native town of Bethlehem. One day, sorely tried by thirst, he expressed a longing for the delicious water of its well near the gate. Upon the word, the three heroes burst through the Philistine forces and returned with the much-coveted draft. But their leader would not drink of the blood of the men that had gone in jeopardy of their lives and poured it forth as a libation before the Lord. Other bands now joined him. Amongst these were eleven mighty men, their faces like the faces of lions, their feet as swift as the rose upon the mountains. First Chronicles, verse 12, number 8. From the uplands of Gad beyond Jordan, who swam that river when it had overflowed all its banks. First Chronicles, verse 12, number 15. And found their way to his hold. They were followed by men, not only from the tribe of Judah, but from that of Benjamin, with their chief Amasai. This defection of members of Saul's own tribe at first excited David's suspicion. But the straightforward, honest words of their leader convinced him of their sincerity, and he associated them in the command of his band of six hundred faithful followers. First Chronicles, verse 12, number 16 through 18. Meanwhile, the Philistines attacked Kaila, a town of uncertain situation in the lowland district of Judah, and robbed the threshing floors. At first David's men, in spite of a divine insurance of success, feared to relieve the place, and so incur the hostility of their powerful foe. A second assurance restored their courage. Kayla was rescued, and the Philistines defeated with great slaughter. Whilst here David was joined by another and an important ally in the person of Abiathar, 
the son of the high priest Amalek, bearing sad intelligence. On the day of David's visit to Nob, there was a stranger watching intently all that took place between him and the high priest. This was Doeg, an Edomite, and the chief of Saul's herdmen. 1 Samuel verse 21 number 7 When the king was deploring at Gebeah the defection even of his own tribe, Doeg poured into the royal ear his version of what had occurred at Nob. Transported with rage, the king set for Amalek and all the priests of the line of Ithamar, and charged him with befriending his enemies. In vain, the high priest repelled the charge. Saul sentenced the entire body of the priests to instant death, and gave the signal to his guard to execute it. But they declined to imbrue their hands in such a bloody murder. Thereupon he called on Doeg, who straightway obeyed, and falling upon the unresisting priests, slew in one day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Not content with this, the king put the entire population of the place to the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings. 1 Samuel verse 22, number 19. Such was the sad news which the solitary survivor of the house of Ithamar now announced to David. I knew it, replied the latter. I knew it. That day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. From this day forward, Abiathar remained with David, and having brought with him the high priest Ephod, was enabled by his oracular answers materially to aid David's movements on occasions of difficulty or danger. Meanwhile, the entry of his rival into a town that had gates and bars, 1 Samuel, verse 23, number 7, inspired Saul with the hope of at length capturing David, summoning his forces as if for a regular military expedition. He marched down to Kalea to besiege him and his followers. Aware of the king's secret designs, David consulted the divine will by means of the ephod, and thus ascertaining the intention of the townspeople to betray him. He and his men departed, and went whithersoever they could. 1 Samuel, verse 23, number 13. End of Book 8, Chapter 6book 10 part 2 chapter 6 of a class book of old testament history by g f mcclear this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cliff stone of sydney australia a class book of old testament history by g f mcclear book 10 part 2 chapter 6 Elisha and Naaman, Siege of Samaria. Second Kings, chapters 5 and 6, B.C. 894 to 892. But Elisha's fame was soon to overstep the limits of his own country. The captain of the army of Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, at this time was named Naaman. See Luke 4, verse 27. He had achieved many victories for his master, and for personal prowess was held in high honour, being in close attendance on his sovereign, but he was a leper. This frightful malady, which, had he been an Israelite, would have cut him off from all intercourse with his fellows, does not appear to have laid him under the same disadvantages in Syria, and he still retained his post as commander-in-chief. In his harem, waiting on his wife, was a little Israelitish maid, who had been taken prisoner in one of the forays of the Syrians over the border. She knew what Elisha could do, and assured her mistress that if only Naaman was with the prophet that was in Samaria, he would certainly be cured of his malady. Her words were told to Naaman, who communicated them to Ben-Hadad. The Syrian king thereupon wrote a letter to Jehoram, king of Israel, and sent his general with it, accompanied by a large retinue bearing ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and six of the rich fabrics for which Damascus had always been famous. On reaching Samaria, Naaman presented the letter to Jehoram, who had no sooner read the curt words of the Syrian king 
Then he rent his clothes and exclaimed, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth said unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? He could only think of one motive for the letter. Consider, said he, how this man seeketh a quarrel against me. Second Kings 5 verse 7 News of Naaman's arrival, of the purport of his coming, and of the dismay of the king was conveyed to Elisha, who straight away sent to Jehoram and bade him send his visitor to him, that he might know that there was a prophet in Israel. With his horses, his chariots, and entire cavalcade, Naaman thereupon came and stood before the door of the prophet's dwelling. But instead of coming forth himself, Elisha simply sent his servant to tell him to go down to the rapid waters of the Jordan and wash seven times, promising him a certain cure. The prophet's independent tone, the neglect to come out to him, above all his command that he, the native of a city watered by such famous streams as the Abana and Farpa, should go and wash in Jordan, was unbearable. Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his retinue, unwilling to throw up the hopes of their long journey, succeeded in persuading him to make trial of the prescribed cure. Naaman accordingly went down and dipped himself seven times in the rushing stream, and his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Full of gratitude for so priceless a boon, he then returned with his whole retinue to Samaria, and once more stood before the prophet's door. This time, however, he not only stood there, but went in and gratefully acknowledged the power of Israel's God, and urged the prophet to receive the present he had brought. This the latter absolutely declined and in spite of Naaman's urgency persisted in his refusal. But one thing the grateful soldier was resolved to have. If Elisha would not accept his presence, he could not depart from a land where he had received so great a benefit without two mules' burden of its hallowed earth, for the construction, probably, of an altar to Jehovah. But here a difficulty occurred to him. If he became a servant of Jehovah, how could he go to the house of Rimon and bow before the Syrian god. Elisha's simple reply was, Go in peace, and he went his way. 2 Kings 5 verses 1 to 20 The generous conduct, however, of his master had not escaped the notice of Gehazi, the attendant of Elisha, and the Syrian had not gone any great distance when he ran after his chariot. Naaman discerned him hurrying along the road, and, alighting, inquired if all was well. All was well, the other replied, but already there had come to his master from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets, for whom he solicited a talent of silver and two changes of raiment. The generous Syrian pressed upon him two talents and two changes of raiment, and sent two of his retinue to bear them to a secret place, whence Gehazi removed them into the house, and then presented himself before his master, denying, when questioned, that he had gone anywhere. But the prophet had marked his wickedness. His heart had gone after him the whole while, and with righteous sternness he now pronounced upon him the awful punishment from which Naaman had just been delivered, and he went out of his presence a leper as white as snow. 2 Kings 5 verse 27 Elisha is next found at Jericho. Here the habitation of the sons of the prophets had become so small that they desired to construct a new dwelling near the Jordan. Accompanied by Elisha, they proceeded towards the river and began to fell trees in the wood which lined its banks. As they felled, the head of an axe, which one of them had borrowed, flew off and sank in the water. He appealed to Elisha, who bade a piece of wood be flung into the stream when the iron reappeared and was restored to the borrower. 2 Kings 6 verses 1 through 7 Shortly after this, in spite of the cure wrought upon their general, the Syrians renewed their marauding incursions and even encamped in spots which the king of Israel was wont to frequent. Warned by Elisha, Jehoram was on more than one occasion able to escape the ambuscades laid for him, which so annoyed Ben-Hadad that he even suspected treachery among his own retinue. But one of his servants pointed to the true cause. The informer was no other than the healer of his general Naaman, and his power was such that he could tell Jehoram the very words Ben-Hadad uttered in his chamber. 
Thereupon the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a considerable force to Dothan, six miles north of Samaria, to capture Elisha. The Syrian forces completely surrounded the village, and the prophet's servant came running out, crying, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Elisha calmed his fears with the assurance that they which were with them were more than they which were with the foe, and the eyes of the young man being opened, he was enabled to discern the hill on which the village was built, filled with horses and chariots of fire, ready to protect his master. At the same moment, the Syrian forces were smitten with blindness and were easily led away to Samaria, nor were their eyes opened till they found themselves in the presence of Jehoram. The first impulse of the king of Israel was to put them to death. But Elisha dissuaded him from such unworthy conduct, and the men were sent back to Ben-Hadad, who drew off his army and for a while desisted from the invasion. 2 Kings 6 verses 8 to 24 But the Syrian king could not long brook such a humiliating repulse. Mustering therefore all his troops, he went up and besieged Samaria, B.C. 892, for a space of three years, during which period the inhabitants were reduced to the direst extremities. Two mothers even agreed to boil their children for food. Compare Deuteronomy 28 verses 53 and 57. One actually did so, but the other hid her child lest it should suffer such an awful fate. This story was told Jehoram as he one day passed by on the city wall, and in token of sorrow he put on sackcloth beneath his armour. But deeming Elisha in some way culpable for the nation's disasters, he threatened to take away his life and sent a messenger to the prophet's house where he sat surrounded by the elders of the city to carry it into execution. Before, however, the messenger's feet had touched the threshold, Elisha, warned of his danger, had commanded that he should be held fast. At this moment, Jehoram himself also entered, leaning on the hand of one of his officers. This evil he burst forth is from Jehovah. Why should I wait on Jehovah any more? Compare Job 21 verse 15, Malachi 3 verse 14. To which the prophet replied, Hear the word of Jehovah. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria. Nay, interposed the royal officer, if Jehovah would make windows in heaven, this could not be. It will, replied Elisha, thou thyself shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat a morsel thereof. Second Kings 7 verse 2 These marvellous and prophetic words were fully verified. In the twilight of the self-same evening, four lepers who were wont to take their place at the gate of the city, despairing of life, resolved to enter the Syrian camp and brave their fate. Reaching the edge of the encampment, to their great surprise, they found no man there. Alarmed by a mysterious noise of chariots, horses and a great host, the Syrians had concluded that the kings of the Hittites and Egyptians had come to the aid of the beleaguered city and had hastily fled, leaving their camp and everything in it just as it was. Amidst the deepening gloom, the lepers entered a tent, satiated the pangs of hunger and then secretly hid a quantity of silver, gold and raiment. Entering a second, they did the same, and then fearing harm if they concealed such joyous news, they hastily returned to Samaria, and announced to the water at the barred gate, 2 Kings 7 verse 10, that they had visited the Syrian camp and found nothing but horses tied and asses tied and the tents as they were. The water carried the news to his chief and he communicated it to the king's household. Though it was midnight, Jehoram was roused and informed of the strange news. Fearful of a plot to draw the Israelites away from the city, he ordered two horsemen to reconnoitre and discover whether it was really true. They made their way towards the Jordan and found the road filled with garments and vessels, which the Syrians had flung away in their precipitate flight. Their return with this welcome news roused the whole city. Starving and emaciated, the entire population rushed forth to the gate and thence made their way to the Syrian camp. To preserve some degree of order, the king entrusted the command of the gate to the officer who had scoffed at the prophecy of Elisha, but so great was the press and confusion 
that he was trodden to death by the excited crowd, and before evening the words of the prophet had been fulfilled to the letter. Two measures of barley were sold for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel, and Samaria was delivered. Second Kings 7 verses 17 to 20 End of Book 10, Part 2, Chapter 6 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G.F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 1, A Session of Jehu. Second King Chapters 8 through 10, BC 884. After this signal discomfiture, Ben Hadad returned to Damascus, and before long lay prostrate with his last illness. At this time Elisha was present in the city, and the king, being informed of it, sent Hazael, an officer in high position at his court, to inquire whether he should recover of his disease. With forty camels' burden of the choicest products of the Syrian capital, Hazael presented himself before the prophet, and preferred his request in the most humble tones. Elisha replied that his master might indeed recover, but yet that he would not. Wondering at these ambiguous words, Hazael fixed upon him a long and searching glance, and the prophet burst into tears. Why weepeth, my lord? inquired the other. And Elisha, who saw in him the destined successor of Ben-Hadad, replied, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. But such a future had no sorrow for his listener. It was only too good to expect. What is thy servant, he replied, dog that he is, that he should do this great thing? The prophet, without making any remark, simply announced the message Elijah had long ago been bidden to deliver, Jehovah hath shown me, said he, that thou shalt be king over Syria. Second Kings 8 verses 7 to 13 With these mysterious words sounding in his ears, Hazael returned to his master and told him but the half of the prophet's answer. That day was the last of Ben-Hadad's life. On the morrow he was found suffocated, with a thick cloth dipped in water spread upon his face. Whether or no Hazael's hand had done the deed, his path was now clear, and he mounted the Syrian throne. Meanwhile there had been changes in the kingdom of Judah. After an unsuccessful attempt to quell a rebellion of his vassal, the king of Edom, 2 Kings 8 verse 20, 2 Chronicles 21 verses 8 through 10, see Genesis 27 verse 40, Jehoram died and was succeeded by Ahaziah, B.C. 885, the issue of his father's ill-starred marriage with the daughter of Jezebel. True to the traditions of his mother, he signalized his accession by the grossest idolatries, Second Chronicles 22 and verse 3. But soon, like his rival, the king of Israel began to feel the hand of the new monarch of Syria, who had already made an attempt to recover the stronghold of Ramoth-Gilead. In intimate alliance, the two kings now crossed the Jordan to defend the place, and an engagement ensuing, Jehoram was severely wounded and forced to return to Jezreel, whither also Ahaziah followed him. Second Kings 9 verses 28 and 29 During their absence, Elisha, knowing that the time was now come for the doomed destruction of Ahab's family, sent a young man, one of the sons of the prophets, to Ramoth-Gilead, with a horn of oil and a commission to look out and anoint Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. As one of Ahab's guards, Jehu, in company with Bidkar, had ridden behind his master to the fatal plot of Naboth's vineyard, and heard the terrible warning of Elijah against his murderer, 2 Kings 9 verse 25. 
Since then, he had risen to a position of some importance and was now well known for his vehemence and activity as well as his rapid, furious driving. According to his instructions, the young disciple of the prophets went to Ramoth Gilead and finding Jehu seated in the midst of his offices, intimated that he had an errand for his ear alone. Together the two retired to an inner chamber, and there the youth, having poured the oil on Jehu's head and announced the divine will that he should be king over Israel and utterly exterminate the whole family of Ahab, opened the door and fled. Shortly afterwards, Jehu came forth and rejoined his comrades, who eagerly inquired the purport of the mad fellow's visit. At first, he tried to evade the question, but soon revealed all that the other had said. Instantly, the enthusiasm of his hearers was kindled. Recognizing the truth of the prophetic call, they threw off each man his garment, and placing Jehu on a rude throne or carpet of state, blew the trumpets and shouted, Jehu is king. Then, for everything depended on the speed of his movements, without losing a moment, Jehu drove his chariot towards the fords of Jordan, and thence direct to Jezreel. From the tower of the latter city, the watchman observed his hurrying chariot, and announced the fact to Jehoram, who straight away sent a horseman to inquire, Is it peace? The crafty conspirator detained the messenger. Then a second horseman was dispatched, and he too was detained. By this time the watchman was better able to distinguish the advancing charioteer and pronounced him to be no other than Jehu, the son of Nimshi. Thereupon the chariot of the king of Israel was made ready, and with Ahaziah, king of Judah, he set out to meet him, probably expecting tidings of the Syrian war. But he was quickly and terribly undeceived. His question, Is it peace, Jehu? was met by a furious denunciation of the idolatries of his mother Jezebel, and in an instant, divining his danger, he turned his chariot towards Jezreel. But at that moment Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and shot him to the heart. While he paused to charge Bidkar to take up his corpse and fling it into the portion of Naboth, Ahaziah, pursued by his soldiers, fled down the westward plain towards Bethgan, or the village of Enganim but was overtaken and wounded and died at Megiddo, whither he managed to escape. Jehu's next step was to make for Jezreel. Here Jezebel, the queen mother, still retained her influence, and hearing of the approach of the conspirator, she resolved to confront him in person. After the oriental fashion, she tired her head and painted her eyes with antimony, and as Jehu passed beneath the palace, cried out from the lattice window, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? On that, Jehu looked up and called aloud, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three eunuchs, looking out, he bade them throw her down, and they threw her down before his chariot, and her blood was sprinkled partly on the palace wall and partly on his horses, while with merciless severity he trod her underfoot. Then he entered the palace and ate and drank. But remembering the fallen queen, he commanded that she should be buried. His messengers went forth to execute his commands, but when they reached the open space before the city walls, they found nothing but her skull and feet and the palm of her hands. The dogs which prowl about the streets of eastern cities had devoured all the rest, and thus fulfilled the words of Elijah. In the portion of Jezreel, Shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel? Second Kings 9 verse 36 The thoughts of the conqueror now turned towards Samaria. Here resided the sons and grandsons of Ahab, to the number of seventy persons. To the elders of the city, therefore, he wrote letters, bidding them select the best and meetest of their master's sons, set him on his father's throne, and fight for their master's house. This proposition terrified the servile elders, and they replied that they had no idea of setting up a rival king, and were perfectly ready to submit in all things to the usurper's will. On this, Jehu wrote a second letter, proposing as a test of their fidelity that they should send to Jezreel on the next day the heads of the seventy descendants of Ahab, and then repair thither themselves. His commands were duly executed. 
The seventy heads were sent to Jezreel, and by Jehu's command placed in two heaps at the entrance of the gate, where they remained all night. In the morning the usurper went forth and acknowledged to the awestruck crowd that he had conspired against his master, but threw the blame of the slaughter of Ahab's descendants on their guardians at Samaria, who had thus fulfilled the words of Elijah. He then proceeded to exterminate all the acquaintance of Ahab at Jezreel, the officers of his court, and the hierarchy of Ashtaroth, and finally set out in person for Samaria. 2 Kings 10 verse 12 On the road, he first met forty-two sons or nephews of the late king of Judah, and discovering who they were, directed that they too should be put to death at the well of the shearing house between Jezreel and Samaria. A little further on, he encountered Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, of the race of the Kenites, who had bound his descendants to drink no wine, to build no houses, to sow no seed, neither to plant nor possess vineyards, but to adhere to the old nomadic life and dwell in tents. Jeremiah 35 verses 6 and 7 Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? exclaimed Jehu when he saw him. The other assured him that it was, and was bidden thereupon to ascend his chariot and come and see his zeal for Jehovah. Thus side by side the two drove into the city where the butchery of Ahab's relatives was renewed till none were left remaining. But this was only preparatory to another and still greater blow. Convening an assembly of the people, Jehu announced his intention of inaugurating the worship of Baal on a scale of the greatest magnificence. Ahab, said he, served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Then under pain of death he commanded the entire hierarchy of Baal and all his worshippers throughout Israel to assemble in the great temple which Ahab had built in honour of this god. 1 Kings 15 verse 32 On the appointed day they came, and the building was filled from end to end. The sacred vestments, probably of white linen, were brought forth, the worshippers arrayed in them, the temple cleared of any chance worshippers of Jehovah, and then Jehu and Jehonadab entered, and the king himself offered the burnt offering. He had hardly ended when eighty trusty warriors, who had secretly received their orders, rushed in and commenced an indiscriminate slaughter of the unarmed and helpless assembly. The huge image of Baal was broken, the smaller images burnt, and the temple itself converted to the basest uses. Second Kings 10 verses 26 and 27 End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 1 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 2. Athaliah and Joash, Death of Elisha. 2 Kings chapters 6 through 14, 2 Chronicles chapters 22 and 23, BC 894 to 839. Thus, after scenes hitherto unparalleled in the history of the chosen nation, Jehu established himself upon the throne and reigned upwards of 28 years. Those years are almost blank to us. All we know is that though commended for the destruction of Ahab's worthless dynasty and assured that his descendants to the fourth generation should sit upon the throne, he persisted in walking in the ways of Jeroboam and retained the old calf worship at Dan and Bethel. But his reign was not a peaceful one. The Lord began to cut Israel short. Hazael attacked his kingdom and ravaged the territories of the tribes east of the Jordan. 2 Kings 10 verse 33 Meanwhile, similar scenes of extermination had been enacted even in the southern kingdom of Judah. On the death of Ahaziah, B.C. 884, Athaliah, the queen mother, 
who had probably been entrusted with the royal functions during his absence at Jezreel, resolved to seize the supreme power and for this purpose put to death all the members of the royal house who had not already perished by the sword of Jehu. From the general massacre, Joash, the infant son of Ahaziah, alone escaped and was concealed by his aunt Jehosheba, wife of Jehoiada, the high priest, in the house of the Lord for the space of six years. Second Chronicles 22 verses 11 and 12 During this period, the usurpation of Athaliah was endured, but in the seventh year, B.C. 878, her foreign practices having probably disgusted the nation, the high priest deemed it an auspicious moment to bring about a change. Gathering round him all the supporters of the family of David, he placed a large force of priests and Levites in three bands at the entrances of the temple, and armed the captains of hundreds with the consecrated spears and shields placed there by David. Then before them, and a number of the people who favoured his design, he brought out the infant Joash, and in the presence of all, publicly crowned and anointed him, and presented him with a copy of the law. The noise of the people reached the ears of the Queen Mother, and she came into the temple only to see her grandson already placed on a raised throne and invested with regal functions. Jehoiada had given strict orders that she should not be put to death within the sacred enclosure, and crying treason, she was hurried from the rangers and slain at the entrance of the horse gate by the royal palace. 2 Kings 11 verses 4 through 16, 2 Chronicles 23 verses 12 to 15. A covenant was then solemnly ratified between the king, high priest, and people, by which they bound themselves to be faithful to Jehovah, and in proof thereof attacked the temple of Baal which Athaliah had built, slew its attendant priest, Matan, and broke down the altars and images. During the lifetime of his aged counsellor, the youthful sovereign ruled his kingdom prudently, and was blessed with a large measure of prosperity. In the twenty-third year of his reign, he commenced a complete repair of the temple, which had suffered much during the late usurpation. Messengers were dispatched throughout his dominions to levy contributions for the work, which were willingly bestowed both by princes and people. But on the death of the high priest, at the advanced age of 130 years, a change came over the policy and character of the king. At the suggestion of the princes of Judah, the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth was revived, and the service of Jehovah neglected. Prophets were sent to rebuke the king for this apostasy, but their protests were unavailing. One of them, Zechariah, the son of the late high priest, as a penalty for his bold outspoken honesty, was stoned to death between the holy place and the altar of burnt offering. Matthew 23 verse 35 His last words, The Lord look upon it and require it, were speedily fulfilled. The year had not ended before the Syrian army commanded by Hazael appeared before Jerusalem. 2 Kings 12 verse 17 it had lately been successful against the Philistine city of Gath, and now, though small in numbers, was able to defeat a large army of Judah, and was only prevailed upon to depart by being permitted to carry away to Damascus all the votive offerings and much of the temple treasures. Nor was Joash destined long to survive this disgrace. Afflicted with a severe illness, probably in consequence of wounds received in the late engagement, he was suddenly attacked by two of his servants and slain in his bed in the fortress of Milo, B.C. 839, 2 Kings 12 verse 20 and 21, 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 26. In addition to their victories over the Philistines, the Syrians under Hazael had been equally successful against the king of Israel, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, reducing him to such a depth of subjection that he was compelled to limit his army to fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand infantry. After an inglorious reign, he bequeathed his throne to his son Jehoash or Joash, B.C. 841, who, in spite of the warnings the nation had already received, persisted in practicing idolatry. During his reign, the aged prophet Elisha fell sick, and Jehoash went to his house and wept over him, 
in the same words that Elijah himself had used when he beheld Elijah carried up into heaven, saying, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. But other thoughts than the prophet's approaching end filled the hearts of both. Hazael was cutting Israel short and ravaging the country far and near. The aged prophet bade the king open the window eastward towards the hated country and place an arrow on the string of his bow. Then, laying his own hands upon the king's hands, he bade him shoot, and as the shaft sped from the string, he followed it with the prophetic blessing, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou hast consumed them. At the prophet's command, the king next took the arrows and smote them on the ground three times, and then stayed. But he did it with no spirit or energy, and the victories he might have achieved were limited to three. Second Kings 13 verses 14 to 19 Shortly afterwards, Elisha died, but his wonder-working power was not to cease with his life. He had not been long laid in the tomb when marauding bands of the Moabites invaded the land. A dead man was about to be buried in the cemetery which contained the prophet's sepulchre. Seeing the band of spoilers, the mourners hastily thrust the corpse into the receptacle where the prophet lay, and no sooner did it touch his remains than the man revived and stood upon his feet. The victories, however, which Elisha had promised were realized. Three times was Joash enabled to triumph over the Syrian armies and recovered the cities which the Israelites had lost in previous wars. Second Kings 13 verse 25 End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 2 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 3 of a class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 3. Amaziah and Jeroboam the Second, Era of Jonah. Second Kings chapter 14, Jonah chapters 1 through 4, BC 840 to 758. Meanwhile, Amaziah had succeeded to the throne of Judah. His first care after his accession was to punish the murderers of his father, which he did with unusual lenity, sparing their children in accordance with the true spirit of the Mosaic law. Deuteronomy 24 verse 16. Ezekiel 18 verses 4 and 20. His next resolve was to take vengeance on the revolted Edomites, and for this purpose summoned to his standard 300,000 of Judah, and at the rate of 100 silver talents hired 100,000 of Israel. Second Chronicles 25 verse 6. Warned, however, by a prophet against leading any of the idolatrous Israelites into battle amongst his own forces, he was induced to dismiss his mercenaries, who returned home in great anger. With his own army then he marched against the Edomites, and defeated them with great slaughter in the Valley of Salt, south of the Dead Sea, capturing also their rocky fortress capital Petra or Sela, and flinging ten thousand of his captives headlong from their natives' cliffs. But with strange perversity, he now set up in Jerusalem the idols of the very nation he had just subdued and paid them religious honours. Second Chronicles 25 verse 14 For this apostasy, a prophet threatened him with speedy vengeance, and misfortunes quickly thickened around him. The Israelite mercenaries, in revenge for the loss of booty they had sustained, on their way homewards ravaged many of the towns of Judah. Smarting under this insult, Amaziah was foolish enough to challenge his rival, the king of Israel, to battle. Jehoash replied by the contemptuous parabel of the thistle and the cedar, and bade Amaziah not provoke a contest. The other, however, would not yield, and the rival armies met at Beth Shemesh, on the borders of Dan and Philistia, 
and the men of Judah were utterly defeated. Jehoash even took his rival prisoner and conveyed him as a captive to Jerusalem, the walls of which he broke down on the side nearest to his own kingdom to the extent of four hundred cubits, and after rifling the temple of his treasures and exacting hostages, returned to Samaria. Shortly after this, however, he died and bequeathed his throne to his son Jeroboam II, B.C. 825, while Amaziah survived him fifteen years, at the close of which period a conspiracy was formed against him, from which he fled to Lachish, where he was assassinated and was succeeded by his son, Azariah, or Aziah, B.C. 810. 2 Kings 14, verses 19 and 20. The reign of Jeroboam II, which lasted forty-one years, was the most prosperous the kingdom of Israel had ever known. The new king did not simply content himself with repelling the attacks of the Syrian invaders, but carried the war into their own country, captured their capital Damascus, and recovered all the old dominion of Israel, from Hamath to the Dead Sea, together with the territory of Moab and Ammon. These successes had been predicted, 2 Kings 14 verse 25, by the earliest of the prophets, whose writings as well as words have come down to us. Jonah, the son of Amittai of gath Hepher of Zebulun. The idolatries, however, of the king called forth the protests of Hosea, a prophet of uncertain tribe and birthplace, Hosea 1 verse 1, and Amos, a herdsman of Tekoa, Amos 1 verse 1. Those of Amos were keenly resented by Amaziah, the high priest of Bethel, Amos 7 verse 10, and he reported him to the king as having predicted the destruction of the royal house and the captivity of the nation, Amos 7 verses 11 to 17, which, though not fulfilled in his reign, were only deferred. Azariah, or Uzziah, the new king of Judah, retained the scepter for upwards of 52 years, and was successful in several warlike expeditions. He subjugated the Philistines and dismantled Gath and Ashdod, reduced the Arabians and Mehanims to obedience, and recovered Elath, the famous port on the Red Sea. Second Chronicles 26 verses 2 and 7 He also improved the internal resources of his kingdom, restored the fortifications of Jerusalem, built military engines, and established a powerful army. Moreover, he devoted himself to the encouragement and protection of husbandry, building towers and wells for his numerous herds in the low country and in the plains, and growing vines on the terraces of the mountains. Second Chronicles 26, 9-15 to But in the hour of prosperity, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Assuming priestly functions, he entered the holy place in the temple for the purpose of offering incense on the golden altar. This flagrant violation of the law was resolutely opposed by the high priest Azariah and others of the Levitical body, and drew down upon the king's signal punishment. As he stood, censer in hand by the altar, the leprosy rose up in his forehead, and he hurried in alarm from the sacred enclosure. He was now incapable of discharging the regal functions until the day of his death lived in a separate house, while Jotham, his son, was entrusted with the regency and eventually succeeded him, B.C. 758. Second Kings 15 verse 5, Second Chronicles 26 verses 16 to 22. Meanwhile, the great empire, destined to be the instrument of punishing the apostate kingdom of Israel, was advancing with gigantic strides in the path of universal conquest. Beyond the territory of the Syrians, the scourge of Jehu and his dynasty was the far more powerful empire of the Assyrians, including the whole region watered by the Tigris and Euphrates, and already augmented by important conquests in Cappadocia, Armenia and Babylonia. To Nineveh, its celebrated capital, the prophet Jonah, already mentioned, was directed to go and denounce its approaching doom, unless its people repented of their sins. The prophet shrunk from this arduous commission, and instead of crossing the Syrian desert, went down to Joppa, and there took ship for Tarshish, probably Tartessus, on the southern coast of Spain. Jonah 1 and verse 3. But during the voyage, an awful storm arose, and in their alarm the mariners threw him at his own request into the sea, where a large fish took him up, and after three days and three nights 
flung him forth alive on the dry land. Matthew 12, verse 40, chapter 16, verse 4, and Luke 11, verse 30. Thus miraculously delivered, he was a second time bidden to undertake the arduous journey, and now not daring to disobey, arose and went. Suddenly appearing in the midst of Nineveh, clothed in his rough prophet's robe, he cried through corridor and lane and square, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. His mysterious words filled the hearts of all with fear and consternation, and before long reached the palace, where the king sat on his royal throne in the great audience chamber, surrounded by all the pomp and magnificence of his court. The words of the unknown prophet touched even his heart, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Jonah 3 and verse 6. Then he proclaimed a decree that all his people, from the greatest even to the least, should be covered with sackcloth and that even the beasts should be put in mourning. His decree was obeyed, a fast was observed, and the people of Nineveh, laying aside their revelry and feasting, assumed the garb of mourning, humbled themselves, turned from their evil way, and offered up petitions for mercy to the Most High. Their repentance was accepted. God had pity on the great city, with its 120,000 persons that could not discern between their right hand and their left, and deferred the judgment. In vain the prophet sat in his booth of woven boughs at the east side of the city, waiting for the doom he had denounced. In vain he complained of the deferring of the punishment. God was more merciful than man, and for more than another century Nineveh was to stand unharmed. Jonah 4 verses 5 through 11 End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 3 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear, Book 10, Part 3. Chapter 4, Decline and Captivity of the Kingdom of Israel. 2 Kings, Chapters 15 through 17, B.C. 773 to 721. The death of Jeroboam II, B.C. 783, was the signal for a frightful state of anarchy in the kingdom of Israel. At length, after an interregnum of eleven years, Zechariah, his son, succeeded to the throne, B.C. 773. His brief reign of six months served only to exhibit his addiction to idolatrous practices when he was assassinated by Shalom, and with him the dynasty of Jehu came to an end. The reign of the usurper was briefer still, for one month only did he retain the royal power, and then was deposed in his turn by Menahem, the son of Gadi, B.C. 772. Either at the beginning or at the somewhat later period, during his reign of ten years, the new king ordered a promiscuous massacre of the inhabitants of the country between Terzar and Thapsacus, probably for the purpose of inspiring terror into the hearts of many who were unfavourable to his cause. 2 Kings 15, verse 14. A more significant circumstance during his reign was the appearance of the Assyrians on the northeastern frontier of his kingdom. Paul, king of Assyria, having been successful in his expedition against Damascus, advanced also against Israel, and was only induced to draw off his forces by a timely gift of 1,000 talents of silver, which Menahem wrung from his people by an assessment of 50 shekels a head, from 60,000 Israelites. 2 Kings 15, verse 20. Menahem died in peace, bequeathing his throne to his son Pekahiah, B.C. 761, who only reigned for two years and was then assassinated in his palace by Pekah, son of Remaliah, a captain of his bodyguard, B.C. 759. The new king displayed a far greater energy than his immediate predecessors, 
The enormous tribute levied by the king of Assyria had greatly exhausted the resources of his kingdom. He resolved, by way of compensation, to ally himself with Syria and attack the rival kingdom of Judah. During the vigorous reign of Jotham, he does not seem to have been able to carry out the latter part of this design, but on the death of that monarch and the accession of his weak son Ahaz, B.C. 742, he advanced against Jerusalem in alliance with Rezan, king of Syria, and took a vast number of captives who were, however, restored by the advice of the prophet Oded. Second Chronicles 28, 8-15 So far as the Syrians were concerned, the expedition was successful. Rezan captured the port of Elath, drove the Jews out of the place, and settled there a Syrian colony. But in other respects, the unnatural alliance of Israel and Syria was calamitous. In his extremity, Ahaz resolved to seek the assistance of Tiglath-Pileser, the successor of Paul, on the Assyrian throne, and for this purpose sent him a large and valuable present from the temple treasures. 2 Kings 16 verse 7 The Assyrian monarch readily embraced the opportunity of crushing the formidable alliance of Syria and Israel. Marching against Damascus, B.C. 740, he captured the Syrian capital, slew reason, and carried off his subjects to Kerr. 2 Kings 15, verse 29. Then turning his arms still further westward, he fell upon the northern towns in Pekar's dominions, Ejon, Abel Beth Maka, Hazor, and others, and carried off the inhabitants to remote districts within his own dominions. Pekar was now reduced to the position of a humble vassal of the great lord of Assyria, and was obliged to abstain from any further hostilities against Ahaz. But that king had purchased this temporary relief at a great cost. Not only was he obliged to yield up the temple treasures as tribute to Tiglath-Pileser, but he had to appear also in person at Damascus as a vassal of that monarch, and did homage to his protector and even to his protector's gods. Because, said he, the gods of the kings of Syria help them, therefore I will sacrifice to them, that they may help me. And he not merely conformed to heathen rites, but actually sent to Urijah, the high priest at Jerusalem, the pattern of an altar he had seen in the Syrian capital, and desired that another should be made like it. The high priest obeyed, and the idolatrous altar was placed within the sacred precincts of the temple, and the king himself offered sacrifice thereon. Moreover, every city in the dominion shared in the idolatries of the capital. Everywhere Ahaz made high places to burn incense to other gods, introducing the worst superstitions of the remotest east, practicing necromancy and witchcraft. Isaiah 8 verse 19, causing his children to pass through the fire in the valley of Hinnom to Moloch. 2 Kings 16 verse 3, dedicating sacred horses to the sun, and raising altars on the housetops for the worship of the heavenly bodies. Second Kings twenty three twelve, Second Chronicles twenty eight verses two to four. While the southern kingdom thus seemed bent on rivaling that of Israel in idolatrous excesses, the fortunes of the latter kingdom had become more and more gloomy. After a reign of twenty years, Pekah was assassinated, BC seven thirty seven, by Hoshea, the son of Elah who, after several years of anarchy, was strong enough to secure the scepter for himself, B.C. 730. His reign, indeed, was not so sinful as that of his predecessors, 2 Kings 17 verse 2, but the doom of Israel was nigh at hand. He had been on the throne but a few years when Shalmaneser, the successor of Tiglath-Pileser, invaded his territory and reduced Israel to vassalage. This induced Hoshea to open a secret correspondence with So Sabako I, king of Egypt. But news of his defection reaching the ears of the Assyrian monarch, he summoned Hoshea to Damascus to explain his conduct, and there placed him in prison. Then, mustering his forces, he invaded his territory and laid siege to Samaria, B.C. 723. Its natural strength enabled that city to hold out for three years, during which period Shalmaneser appears to have been obliged to return to Damascus in consequence of a successful revolt headed by Sargon, to whom he forfeited his crown. 
But this change brought no respite to the beleaguered capital of Israel. After a protracted resistance, it was captured, B.C. 721, and thus Sargon completed the conquest which Shalmaneser had begun. Vast numbers of the remaining tribes were now removed into captivity and located partly in Gozan or Magdonia and partly in the cities lately taken from the Medes. Their place was filled by a foreign population from the more inland districts of the empire and colonies from Cutha, Hamath and Sepharvaim possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities of Israel, whose existence as an independent kingdom now came to an end forever. End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 4 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G.F. McClear Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G.F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear, Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 5, Reign of Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapters 18 to 20, 2 Chronicles chapters 24 to 32, BC 726 to 698. While the kingdom of Israel thus came to an end, that of Judah seemed to have taken a fresh lease of vitality. At the close of the wicked reign of Ahaz, his son Hezekiah succeeded to the throne B.C. 726 and proved to be one of the best of the monarchs of the line of David. His first act after his accession was to set on foot a thorough religious reformation. He removed the high places break down the images and even destroyed the brazen serpent, the ancient relic of the wanderings which had become an object of idolatrous worship under the name of Nehushtan, Second Kings 18 verse 4. He then cleansed and purified the temple and reopened it with splendid sacrifices conducted by the reinstated priests and Levites, Second Chronicles 24 verses 20 to 36, and resolved to celebrate a peculiar Passover, and invite to it all throughout the land of Palestine who bore the Hebrew name. Second Chronicles 30 verses 1 through 10. To this end he dispatched messengers throughout Judah, and northwards through Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun. The remnant of the once powerful house of Joseph treated his invitation with scorn, but all Judah and many of the smaller tribes assembled at Jerusalem and took part in the great national rite, which was celebrated at an unusual but not an illegal period, and lasted upwards of 14 days. The associations awakened by this ancient ordinance roused the people to a becoming zeal for the true God, and on their return from Jerusalem, a general destruction of idolatrous images and temples was set on foot throughout Judah and Benjamin, and even some portions of the northern kingdom. Second Chronicles 31 Verse 1. Seconded in his pious efforts by the noble-minded prophet Isaiah, the king proceeded to carry out other religious reforms and was rewarded for his zeal by a large measure of prosperity. Venturing to assume the offensive against the Philistines, he not only recovered the territory which his father had lost, but gained other important advantages. 2 Kings 18 verses 7 and 8. This success emboldened him to throw off the Assyrian yoke and to decline forwarding the usual tribute. The late capture of Samaria by the Assyrians would render probable a speedy vengeance for this defection. But the wealthy city of Tyre, now the head of the Phoenician kingdom, was first to feel the weight of the Assyrian arms, and its inhabitants made such a stubborn resistance that after operations extending over five years, the design was given up as impracticable. The time thus gained was not thrown away by Hezekiah. He used every effort to strengthen his capital against the expected invasion, repaired the walls, built towers, set captains over the host, stopped up the wells, diverted the watercourses, 2 Chronicles 32 verses 3 and 4. 
forged weapons of war, and while most of his people trembled at the certain coming of the great Assyrian conqueror, and many of his advisers would have made an alliance with Egypt, the monarch was exhorted by Isaiah not to lose his confidence in God. At length, in the fourteenth year of his reign, 2 Kings 18 verse 13, the invader appeared. Sennacherib, the successor of Sargon, came up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. 2 Kings 18 verse 13. Thereupon Hezekiah thought it prudent to avert his wrath by a promise of submission and consented to pay 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, to raise which enormous sum he was obliged to spoil the temple of many of its treasures and even to strip the gold from the gates. 2 Kings 18 verses 14 to 16. The respite thus obtained was only temporary. Two years had barely elapsed before Sennacherib, resolved to conquer the now flourishing kingdom of Egypt, commenced a second expedition through the dominions of Judah. While one of his generals attacked and captured Ashdod, he himself marched through Palestine and laid siege to Libna and Lachish, cities in the maritime lowland of Judah, and at this time subject to Egypt. From Lachish, however, he sent the Tartanor, his commander-in-chief, the Rabsaris, or his chief eunuch, and the Rabshakeh, his chief cupbearer, with a large force to Jerusalem to demand its surrender. On this occasion, the chief cupbearer seems to have been at the head of the embassy. Standing by the conduit of the upper pool and speaking in the Hebrew tongue, he proclaimed to the advisers of Hezekiah and the people assembled on the city walls the message of the king of Assyria, exhorting them not to look for deliverance from Egypt or even to place any confidence in their God. For what God had yet been able to deliver his land and people out of the hand of his master? Second Kings 18 verses 33-34 By command of Hezekiah, his scornful message was received in profound silence. The king himself, on being informed of the purport of the Assyrian embassy, with clothes rent and robed in sackcloth, repaired to the temple, and sent his minister, similarly attired to Isaiah, to entreat him in his perilous hour to lift up his prayer in behalf of his people. That undaunted prophet in reply bade his master defy boldly all the efforts of the enemy, that God, whom the Assyrian had blasphemed, would avenge his insulted honour, he would send a blast upon him, and he should hear a rumour, and should return to his own land, there to fall by the sword. These trustful words encouraged both king and people, and the Assyrian ambassadors, finding it impossible to terrify the capital of Judah into subjection, returned to Sennacherib, whom they found at Libna, having taken or raised the siege of Lachish. 2 Kings 19 and verse 8. But while he was thus employed, news reached the ears of that monarch that Tiraka or Tarakos, a powerful king of Ethiopia, was on the march against him. On this he resolved to make one more effort to terrify Hezekiah into submission and send a second embassy to him, with a letter demanding in the most peremptory terms the surrender of the city, recapitulating the cities whose gods had been powerless to deliver them out of his hands and bidding him dismiss the notion that he could escape. On receiving this vaunting letter, Hezekiah again repaired to the temple, and there spread it before the Lord, entreating in words of singular pathos and beauty the aid of the God of Israel who dwelt between the cherubims. Second Kings 19 verse 15 His prayer was heard. Isaiah was commissioned to assure the king that the virgin, the daughter of Zion, might laugh to scorn all the efforts of the invader. True it was that the Assyrian monarch had laid waste many cities into ruinous heaps, but it was only because Jehovah himself had so willed it and had raised him up to be an instrument for the accomplishment of his own purposes. And now he would put his hook in the Assyrian's nose and his bridle in his lips and turn him back by the way he had come, nor suffer him even to approach the city or to shoot an arrow there or cast up a bank against it. 2 Kings 19 verse 32 
His words were destined to have a speedy and terrible fulfilment. Having reduced Libna, Sennacherib appears to have pushed forward towards Pelusium, anxious to crush an Egyptian army under a native prince named Sethos before the dreaded Ethiopian monarch Terhak or Tiraka could come to his aid. Within sight of each other, the Assyrian and Egyptian hosts lay down, awaiting the morrow's battle. But that very night, the angel of the Lord, probably by a sudden pestilence or some more awful manifestation of divine power, poured contempt on all the pride of the Assyrian monarch. As they slept, a sudden destruction fell upon his hosts, and when he awoke next morning, behold, 185,000 corpses lay dead in his camp. On this, Sennacherib fled with the shattered remnants of his forces to his own land, where, 17 years after, or B.C. 680, he was assassinated by his sons, Adramalek and Sharazar, as he was worshipping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, leaving his throne to another son, Ezar Haddon, 2 Kings 19, verse 37. At some period after, or as some think before his signal deliverance, Hezekiah was seized with a serious illness, and was warned by the prophet Isaiah to put his house in order, for the decree had gone forth that he must die. This announcement caused the greatest distress to the good king. He had striven to set a good example while he lived, and had done much to reform his people and their religion, and now in the very midst of his work he must die. With many tears, therefore, he turned his face to the wall and pleaded his case with God, praying that the prophet's words might not be so immediately fulfilled. His prayer was heard. Isaiah was bidden to assure him that his life would be prolonged for a space of fifteen years, and as a sign to confirm this assurance, the shadow on the great dial of his father Ahaz went ten degrees backwards, and by the application of a plaster of figs, often used medicinally in such cases, his malady was healed. News of his recovery, and of the astronomical marvel accompanying it, was conveyed into many lands, and various ambassadors with letters and gifts came to his court. Amongst the rest came those of Merodach Baladan, king of Babylon, who with their retinue were escorted over the royal treasures. For the pride and ostentation with which he displayed his rich stores, Hezekiah was rebuked by Isaiah, who foretold that a day was coming when all these treasures would be carried away into the country of the very king whose ambassadors had now come to congratulate him, and that his sons would be compelled to serve as eunuchs in the Babylonian court. 2 Kings 20 verses 17 to 19 The remainder of Hezekiah's reign appears to have been spent in peace and security. His treasury was full, the agricultural resources of the country were developed, various new and useful improvements were carried out in his capital, and on his death, lamented by all Judah and Jerusalem, he was buried with especial honour in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. B.C. 698. Second Chronicles 32 verses 27 to 33. End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 5 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 6, Reign of Manasseh, Reforms of Josiah. 2 Kings chapters 21 to 23, 2 Chronicles chapters 33 to 35, B.C. 698 to 623. On the death of Hezekiah, his son Manasseh succeeded to the throne at a very early age, having been born in all probability twelve years before his father's death, B.C. 710. His mother, whose name was Hepzibah, 
the delightsome one, Isaiah 62 verse 4, was descended from one of the princes of Jerusalem. His own name is remarkable and was born by no one else in the history of the kingdom of Judah. It is the name of the tribe second only to Ephraim in hostility to Judah and has been supposed to have been given to him in remembrance of the fond hope of his father to unite the remnants of Manasseh and other northern tribes in a common worship and faith. The accession of this king at the early age of 12 years was the signal for an entire revolution in the religious policy which his father had so consistently carried out. It has been suggested that the idolatrous party, which had sided with Ahaz and had only been repressed during the reign of Hezekiah, now recovered its old ascendancy and exercised a baneful influence over the youthful monarch. Whether this was so or not, the spirit of loyalty to Jehovah which Hezekiah had evinced was exchanged for a more general adoption of heathen modes of worship than had disfigured even the idolatrous days of Ahaz. Not only were the high places restored, but the worst enormities of Ahab were introduced into Jerusalem. Altars were erected in honour of Baal and Ashtaroth and all the host of heaven, even within the sacred precincts of the temple. Second Chronicles 33 verses 4 and 5 The king himself not only observed times and used enchantments and witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards, Second Chronicles 33 verse 6, but even dedicated some of his sons in the fire to Moloch and slaughtered others. Ezekiel 23 verses 37 to 39. The cries of human victims offered in honour of this hideous deity of the Ammonites re-echoed throughout the valley of Hinnom, and the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were practised with impunity in that city where Jehovah had said that he would put his name for ever. Second Chronicles 33 verse 4 The consequent moral degeneracy was fearful. The old faith was everywhere neglected and despised. The altar of Jehovah was broken down. Second Chronicles 33 verse 16 Even the ark was displaced. Second Chronicles 35 verse 3 And so systematic was the destruction of the sacred books that fifty years later the discovery of the book of the law was an event exciting wonder and astonishment. Second Kings 22 verse 8 While the Sabbath, the sign between the elect nation and Jehovah, was polluted, Isaiah 56 verse 2, 58 verse 13, and under the influence of the king and his idolatrous advisers, the people did more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Second Kings 21 verse 9 Meanwhile, the voice of the prophets was not hushed. Heedless of the doom they incurred, the Lord's true servants bore their faithful testimony against the deeds of the king. They predicted the coming of such judgments on Judah and Jerusalem that whoever heard of them, both his ears would tingle. Second Kings 21 verse 12 The line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab should be stretched over the capital of Judah, and it should be wiped as a man wipeth a dish, and its people should be delivered into the hands of their enemies. Second Kings 21 verses 13 and 14 These outspoken rebukes met with their natural reward. It was now according to the ancient Jewish tradition that the aged Isaiah was sawn asunder, while of other less known but no less faithful servants of Jehovah, such numbers were murdered that the streets of Jerusalem ran with blood. Second Kings 21 verse 16 Such a policy brought its inevitable punishment. Risings of the Philistines, Moabites and Ammonites, Zephaniah 2 verses 4 to 15, Jeremiah 47 to 49, were speedily followed by an invasion of the territory of Judah by the Assyrians. Second Chronicles 33 verse 11 the captains of Esau Haddon, who had crushed the rebellion of Merodach Baladan, invested Jerusalem, took Manasseh captive, and carried him off to Babylon, where, loaded with fetters, he was cast into prison. But in the solitude of his dungeon, the Jewish king repented of the awful wickedness he had committed, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. 
who, in his infinite mercy, listened to his petitions for forgiveness. His defection was pardoned by Esau Haddon, and he was permitted to return to Jerusalem. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 13 The lessons learnt in captivity were not forgotten by the restored monarch. He set himself to effect so much of a religious reformation as his previous character would allow. The worship of Jehovah was renewed, sacrifices were once more offered in his honour, and the heathen altars within the sacred precincts of the temple were destroyed. But the change was naturally but partial. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 17 During his long reign of 55 years, the evil he had done had sunk too deeply to be easily removed. The recollection of the innocent blood he had shed was never forgotten, and at his death he was not laid in the sepulchres of the kings, but in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Uzzah, B.C. 643, 2 Kings 21 verse 26. Amon his son now succeeded to the throne, and after a short reign of two years fell a victim to a conspiracy and was slain in his own palace. The people, however, put the conspirators to death and secured the throne for his son Josiah, now only eight years of age, B.C. 641. Young as he was, the new king displayed a remarkable spirit of loyalty to Jehovah and surpassed even the best of his predecessors in his zeal for the true faith. In the twelfth year of his reign, Second Chronicles 34 verse 3, B.C. 629, he commenced a great reform. In Jerusalem itself he removed the altars dedicated to Baal and all the host of heaven, and burnt the symbol of Ashtaroth at the brook Kidron, and the sacred horses that had been dedicated to the sun. He then commenced a personal tour, not only throughout his own dominions, but throughout Simeon, Ephraim, Manasseh, and even distant Naphtali. Second Chronicles 34 verse 6 At Bethel he visited Jeroboam's chapel, and agreeably to the remarkable prophecy of the disobedient prophet, uttered three hundred years before, broke down the altar and high places that king had set up, exhumed the bones from the sepulchres in the neighbouring mount, and scattered them over the altars. A little further, one of the sepulchres attracted his attention, and in answer to his inquiries, he learnt that it contained the remains of the old prophet of Bethel, and his victim, the man of God from Judah. On this he directed that the sepulchre should be spared, and the venerable relics carefully preserved. 2 Kings 23 verses 15 to 19 Returning to Jerusalem, in the eighteenth year of his reign he empowered a special commission to restore the temple and to levy contributions for this purpose. In the course of his repairs, Hilkiah, the high priest, found a roll containing the book of the law, probably the book of Deuteronomy, which he delivered to Shaphan the scribe or royal secretary. By him portions were read in the ears of the king, who struck with alarm at its awful denunciations, rent his clothes and directed that the divine will should be instantly consulted, that the wrath of heaven might not descend on the apostate nation. The high priest and the rest thereupon sought the advice of the prophetess named Huldah, the wife of Shalem, keeper of the royal wardrobe, who resided in one of the sacred cloisters of the temple. In reply, she assured them that the divine judgments would certainly be fulfilled, not indeed in the reign of Josiah, whose early piety had found favour with Jehovah, but after he had been gathered to his fathers. This answer was in due course returned to the king, who instantly repaired to the temple and caused the awful denunciations on idolatry to be publicly read in the ears of the assembled people. The effect was very great. The people conscience-stricken and appalled, made a solemn covenant and promised to adhere thenceforward to the worship of the true God and agreed to a still more thorough reformation. After a restoration of the ancient Levitical service in the temple, a national celebration of the Passover was decreed and was carried out with a grandeur and magnificence exceeding anything that had been seen on any former occasion. 2 Kings 23 verses 21 to 23 
End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 6 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Read by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 7 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 7 Death of Josiah, Captivity of Judah. Second Kings chapters 23-24, Second Chronicles chapters 35 and 36, BC 623-588. to But the religious reformations of the pious king could not ward off the destined destruction of his kingdom. At this period, the great Assyrian Empire had considerably declined while the kingdom of Egypt, under a powerful monarch named Necho, had recovered much of its ancient glory. This king now resolved to gain possession of Carchemish, which commanded the passage of the Euphrates. From motives which cannot be certainly divined, Josiah resolved to oppose his progress through his own territory, and, in spite of an embassy from the Egyptian monarch begging him not to interfere, drew up his forces at Megiddo, and as though with a presentiment of his doom, disguised himself before entering into battle. His fears were verified. Struck by the Egyptian archers, he was removed from the battlefield to die before he reached Jerusalem, where he was committed to the grave amidst the profoundest grief of his people, and especially of the prophet Jeremiah, who composed a funeral elegy over this last and best of the kings of Judah. B.C. 6.10 2 Chronicles 35 verse 25, Lamentations 4 verse 20. His son and successor, Jehoahaz, or Shalom, Jeremiah 22 verse 11, only held the throne for three months. On his return from Carchemish, Necho condemned the land to pay a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold, and sending for the new king to Riblah in the land of Hamath, put him in bonds and thence removed him to Egypt, where he died. 2 Kings 23 verse 34 His brother Eliakim was now permitted by the Egyptian monarch to ascend the throne and in obedience to the same authority changed his name to Jehoiakim. In the fourth year of his reign, or BC 606, Nebuchadnezzar, placed by his father Nabopolassar at the head of the Assyrian armies, marched forth to avenge the Egyptian invasion. In a pitched battle at Carchemish, Jeremiah 46 verses 1 to 13, he utterly defeated Pharaoh Necho and recovered Coel Syria, Phoenicia and northern Palestine. Then advancing into Judea, he drove all who had no fenced cities and amongst the rest the Rechabites, Jeremiah 35 verse 11, to Jerusalem, captured that city, placed Jehoiakim in fetters, rifled the temple and carried off to Babylon some of the sacred vessels and many of the principal Hebrew nobles, including Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel 1 verses 1 to 6. On promise, however, of faithfulness to his liege lord, Jehoiakim was suffered to retain his kingly dignity at least in name for three years longer. At the close of this period, he had the hardihood to try and throw off the yoke and rebelled against his suzerain but this only involved his kingdom in deeper misery. Unable to take the field in person, Nebuchadnezzar sent a numerous force against him from his now subject provinces of Chaldea and Syria, as well as Moab and Ammon, 2 Kings 24 verse 2. These overran the whole country and reduced it to the lowest degree of wretchedness and misery. During the period of degradation that now ensued, Jehoiakim, either in a contest with some of his many foes, or owing to a rising of his oppressed subjects, came to a violent end. His body lay ignominiously exposed upon the ground, and was buried with the burial of an ass, without pomp or ceremony, beyond the gates of Jerusalem. B.C. 599 Jeremiah 22 verses 18 and 19 36 verse 30 
Jehoiakim his son, also called Jeconiah and Coniah, was now placed upon the throne. 2 Chronicles 36 verse 9 But after a reign of three months and ten days, Nebuchadnezzar's army appeared before Jerusalem, and the young king and his court surrendered at discretion. The temple was again pillaged of such vessels that yet remained. The king himself, the nobles, and chief artisans were removed to Babylon, and none, save the poorest of the population, were left behind. 2 Kings 24 verses 8 to 16 Mataniah, the uncle of the captive king, was now placed by the Babylonian monarch in charge of the exhausted kingdom and took the name of Zedekiah. In defiance of the dictates of common prudence and of the advice of the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 27 and 28, compare Ezekiel 17 verses 12 to 21, he was foolish enough to court an alliance with Pharaoh Hophra or Apres, a new and enterprising monarch in Egypt. Instantly the Babylonian armies were put into motion and overran all Judah, while Jerusalem together with Lachish and Azekar alone held out. A temporary delay was caused by an effort of the king of Egypt to relieve his ally and the necessity of first repulsing the Egyptian forces. This achieved, the Chaldeans again presented themselves before the walls of the holy city and besieged it for upwards of sixteen months. The wretched inhabitants were reduced to the most fearful straits. Famine prevailed throughout the city, 2 Kings 25 verse 3. The tongue of the sucking child clave to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children cried for bread, and no man break it unto them. Lamentations 4 verse 4. Nobles that had ever before fed delicately searched even dunghills for any remnants of food that might be found. Lamentations 4 and verse 5. And mothers boiled their own children. Lamentations 4 verse 10. The Lord at last poured upon the city the cup of his fierce anger for all its iniquities, and its day of doom was come. At length the Chaldean armies effected a breach in the strong walls and made their way into the city. With a few of his troops, Zedekiah effected his escape to Jericho, but was pursued, captured, and sent to Nebuchadnezzar at Riblah. Judgment was then passed upon him, 2 Kings 25 verse 6. And his sons having first been put to death before his face, his eyes were thrust out, and laden with fetters, he was removed to Babylon, B.C. 588. Punishment having thus been inflicted on the king, Nebuzaradan, an officer high in the confidence of the Babylonian monarch, was dispatched to Jerusalem to carry out the complete destruction of the city. By his orders, the temple, the royal palace, the houses of the wealthy were set on fire. The walls were broken down, the sacred vessels of the once glorious house of Jehovah were plundered, the brazen pillars were broken up, the chief priests were put to death, and the rest, with the greater part of the inhabitants, were removed to Babylon. A scanty remnant was permitted to remain in their native land to be vine dressers and husbandmen, Jeremiah 52 verse 16 under the superintendence of Gedaliah, who with a Chaldean guard, Jeremiah 40 verse 1, 2 and 5, was stationed at Mizpah, 2 Kings 25 verse 23, Jeremiah 40 verse 6, a strong fortress six miles north of Jerusalem. Declining the offer of a retreat at Babylon, Jeremiah resolved to share the lot of this miserable remnant in his own land, Jeremiah 40 verse 6. But even the late terrible misfortunes could not calm the spirit of faction. Gedaliah was assassinated under circumstances of revolting treachery by Ishmael, a man of royal blood, together with some of the Chaldean guard. See 2 Kings 25 verse 25, Jeremiah 41 verses 1 to 10. Johanan, one of the captains of the army of Judah, who had in vain warned Gedaliah of his danger, Jeremiah 40 verses 13 to 16, gathered a force and pursued the assassin as far as Gibeon, but he effected his escape beyond Jordan to the country of the Ammonites. Jeremiah 41 verse 15 Then the little remnant of Jews, fearful of the vengeance of the Babylonian monarch, contrary to the advice of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 42 verses 7 to 22, fled into Egypt, and after first settling at Tappanese, Jeremiah 43 verse 7, 
were scattered throughout the country at Migdol, Nof, and Pathros, Jeremiah 44 verse 1, whether also Jeremiah accompanied them to share their fortunes and to die. End of Book 10, Part 3, Chapter 7 Read by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Section 73 of A Class Book of Old Testament History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear Duration, Relation, Contrasts of the Two Kingdoms A footnote for Part 3, Chapter 7 before passing on, a few remarks may here be subjoined respecting the kingdoms of Judah and Israel, which now came to an end. 1. Their respective duration. The kingdom of Israel lasted from B.C. 975 to B.C. 721, or 254 years. The kingdom of Judah lasted from B.C. 975 to B.C. 588, or 387 years thus outliving her more populous and powerful rival by 133 years. 2. Their mutual relations. These, as we have seen, were dictated by three different lines of policy. The first, mutual animosity from B.C. 975 to 918. The first three kings of Judah, Rehoboam, Abijah, and Azza, persisted in the hope of regaining their authority over the ten tribes, and for nearly sixty years there was war between the two kingdoms. Second, close alliance and united hostility to Syria, from B.C. 918 to 1845. With the accession of Jehoshaphat, there sprang up an alliance between the two kingdoms, cemented by intermarriage, and prompted probably by the necessity of joint action in resisting the encroaching power of Syria. Third, fresh animosity and the gradual decline of both kingdoms before the advancing power of the Assyrian Empire from B.C. 884 to 588. The alliance between the kingdoms was rudely shattered by the accession of Jehu to the throne of Israel. He put Azahiah to death, and the hostility thus begun reached its highest pitch under Amaziah, Jehoash, and Pekah. Three, their contrasts. First, in the kingdom of Judah, a, there was always a fixed capital and a venerated center of religion. b, the army was always subordinate. c, the secession was interrupted by no revolution. and d, the priests remained faithful to the crown. Second, in the kingdom of Israel, a, there was no fixed capital and no real religious center. b, the army was often insubordinate. C. The secession was constantly interrupted, so that out of nineteen kings there were no less than nine dynasties, each ushered in by a revolution. D. The authorized priests left the kingdom in a body, and the priesthood established by Jeroboam had no divine sanction and no promise. It was corrupt in its very source. Hence, in the kingdom of Israel, the prophets were the regular ministers of God and especially during the second of the two periods above mentioned, their ministry was distinguished by far more extraordinary events than in the kingdom of Judah, whose annals offered no prophetical deeds like those of Elijah and Elisha. End of section 73。Book 11, Chapter 1 of A Class Book of Old Testament History。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear. Book 11, From the Captivity to the Close of the Canon. Chapter 1, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapters 1 through 3, circa 606 through 570 B.C. Nothing, it has been remarked, could present a more striking contrast to their native country than the region into which the Hebrews were now transplanted. Instead of their irregular and picturesque mountain city, crowning its unequal heights, and looking down into the deep and precipitous ravines, 
through one of which a scanty stream wound along, they entered the vast, square, and level city of Babylon, occupying both sides of the broad Euphrates, while all around spread immense plains, which were intersected by long, straight canals bordered by rows of willows. How unlike their national temple, a small but highly finished and richly adorned fabric, standing in the midst of its courts on the brow of a lofty precipice, the colossal temple of the Chaldean Bell, rising from the plain, with its eight stupendous stories or towers, one above the other, to the perpendicular height of a furlong. The palace of the Babylonian king was more than twice the size of their whole city. It covered eight miles, with its hanging gardens built on arched terraces, each rising above the other, and rich in all the luxuriance of artificial cultivation. How different from the sunny cliffs of their own land, where the olive and the vine grew spontaneously, and the cool, shady, and secluded valleys, where they could always find shelter from the heat of the burning noon! No wonder, then, that, in the pathetic words of their own hymn, by the waters of Babylon they sat down and wept, when they remembered thee, O Zion. Psalm 87, verse 1. Thus far removed from their native land, amidst a strange people and strange rites, and exposed to all the influences of contact with their conquerors, we might, in the usual order of things, have expected that the Jews would have ceased to remain a nation at all. But with them it was not to be thus. The ten tribes, indeed, are never heard of more, but the remnant of Judah and Benjamin in Babylonia, so far from blending its national life with that of its conquerors, remained a separate people, and preserved its national institutions. We shall very much misunderstand their condition if we suppose that the Jews became bondsmen or serfs. They were colonists rather than captives. They received grants of land, agricultural or pastoral, out of the conquered territories at the disposal of Nebuchadnezzar, and so valuable were their services considered that not a few rose to high eminence, Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, and held confidential positions next to the person of the sovereign. While, moreover, they increased in numbers and wealth, they retained an internal jurisdiction over their own members. They kept up among themselves distinction of rank, they preserved their genealogies, Nehemiah 7, verses 5, 6, and 64. And, although from the absence of any common center of worship, they could only observe the Mosaic law in part, still they retained the right of circumcision, the distinction of meats, and other points. Compare Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, with Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Nor did the providence, which had hitherto watched over them, fail them in the land of exile. The voice of prophecy, so far from being hushed, now swelled into louder strains. While Jeremiah warned and exhorted them at the outset of this sad period in their history, Ezekiel did not fail for thirty years to carry on the same work in the land of exile itself, while another, and one of the most illustrious of their number, rose to the very highest position, and proved the Moses of captivity, and the fourth of the greater prophets. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, B.C. 606, as we have already seen, Nebuchadnezzar had ordered the chief of the eunuchs to remove to Babylon certain select youths of royal descent, who, from their talents, seemed likely to be of service to his court. One of these was Daniel, apparently of royal blood, Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, and gifted with no common talents, Daniel 1, verse 4. With three other companions of the tribe of Judah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he was removed to the Babylonian court, and there trained for the king's service in the learning of the language of the Chaldeans, Daniel 1, verse 4. Moreover, in accordance with a common custom, his name was changed, and he and his three companions were now known as Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. During the three years of their training, they were not forgetful of the law and religion of their fathers, and with unusual firmness of character, declined to partake of the daily allowance of meat and wine, supplied them from the royal table, either probably because it was ceremonially unclean, or had been offered in sacrifice to the Assyrian gods. Preferring to live on the simplest fare, they yet proved as comely and well-favored as though they had been fed on the rarest dainties, and when brought before Nebuchadnezzar, were pronounced to excel, in wisdom and knowledge, the wisest men in his empire, and were rewarded with high positions about his court. Daniel 1, verse 5. While they were thus employed, a remarkable circumstance took place. Nebuchadnezzar dreamt a dream which exceedingly troubled his spirit. Summoning the magi and astrologers, he demanded that it should be instantly interpreted. They promised the interpretation, if they might be told the dream. But though this had escaped the monarch's memory, he reiterated his command, and when told that to obey it was impossible, issued an edict commanding the instant destruction of all the wise men throughout his realms. This despotic order was made known to Daniel by Arioch, the captain of the executioners, who was charged to see it carried out. The Jewish exile instantly sought an audience with the monarch, 
and having succeeded in gaining time for a fuller consideration, summoned his three friends, who, with fervent prayer to him, from whom no secrets are hid, besought a revelation of the dream. Their prayers were heard, and at a second audience, Daniel disclosed the vision of the night. The monarch had beheld a great image, the form of which was terrible. The head was of fine gold, the breast and the arms of silver, the belly and sides of brass, the legs of iron, the feet partly iron and partly clay. The excellent brightness of this image the monarch had watched, till he suddenly saw a stone, cut out of a mountain without hands, smite the feet of the image, till it broke in pieces, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, while the stone became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Such was the vision which Daniel then proceeded to interpret. The king himself was this head of gold. To him the God of heaven had given a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. After him should arise another kingdom, inferior to his. After that a third kingdom of brass, which should bear rule over all the earth, to which would succeed a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, breaking in pieces and subduing all things. That kingdom, with its feet and toes, part of iron and part of clay, would be partly strong and partly brittle, and its subjects would mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they would not cleave one to the other, even as iron is not mixed with clay, and would make room for another kingdom, which God himself would set up, to break in pieces and consume all the previous kingdoms, and itself stand forever." Daniel, chapter 2, verses 36 through 45. The great Babylonian monarch was profoundly affected by this proof of superhuman knowledge. He fell down on his face and worshipped Daniel, commanded that an oblation and sweet odors should be offered unto him, bestowed on him costly presents, and made him viceroy over the whole province of Babylon, and supreme over all the wise men of his empire. In the hour of his prosperity, Daniel did not forget his three companions. By his intercession, similar honors were bestowed upon them, while he himself retained the preeminence in the gate of the king. Daniel 2, verses 46 through 49. Though on this memorable occasion the new viceroy had been preeminently faithful to the God of his fathers, and by his ascription of all his wisdom to a higher power, had made the great monarch he served acknowledge that there was a God of gods and Lord of lords, the lesson does not seem to have made a very lasting impression on Nebuchadnezzar's mind. In the vast empire he had won by his arms, there were many different nations, with different gods, and different modes of worship. Over all, he was supreme, and with the true feeling of an oriental despot, it seemed to him only right that they should all acknowledge his chief deity. This was the great Bel, or bel Marodoc, the supreme chief of gods, the king of the heavens and the earth, the Jupiter of the Babylonian pantheon. It was possibly an image of this god, sixty cubits high and six broad, and overlaid with golden plates, which he now proceeded to set up on the plain of Dura, with the command that at the sound of instruments of music, all his subjects, from the highest to the lowest, should fall down and worship it, on penalty of being flung into a burning, fiery furnace. Daniel 3, verses 5 and 6. In accordance with this edict, all the officers of the court of Babylon, and the governors of the different provinces who had been summoned to assist at the ceremony, flocked to the plain of Dura, and with one consent, as soon as the music sounded, prostrated themselves before the great dumb image which their lord had set up. But Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in this hour of trial, remained faithful to the religion of their fathers, neither falling down nor worshipping with the rest. This act of disobedience to their master was quickly perceived by many of the native Chaldeans, who were already filled with jealousy at the elevation of the exiles, and they were not slow in reporting it to Nebuchadnezzar. On hearing it, that monarch's wrath knew no bounds, he summoned them before him. He reiterated the command he had already issued. He warned them, in spite of their high position, they should certainly suffer the penalty of their disobedience. But his words were wasted. These three mighty ones, in the noble army of martyrs, replied that if they were not careful to answer him in this matter, their God could, if such was his will, deliver them from the fiery furnace, and even if he did not, they would not serve the monarch's God, or bow down before the image he had set up. Daniel 3, verses 16 through 18. This outspoken refusal filled Nebuchadnezzar with still greater fury. The form of his visage was changed. He bade the furnace be heated seven times more than it was wont to be heated, and ordered the mightiest captains in his army to bind the three and fling them into the fire. His words were obeyed, but at the cost of the lives of his captains, who fell victims to their zeal, being caught by the raging flames. Moreover, when he looked to see the three martyrs speedily reduced to ashes— Behold, they were observed loose, walking unscathed in the midst of the fire, accompanied by a celestial being, in whom the monarch discerned none other than a son of God. 
Thereupon he drew near to the mouth of the furnace, and bade his intended victims come forth. And they came forth, and on their bodies, as all attested, the fire was seen to have had no power, neither was a hair of their head singed, neither had the smell of fire passed over them. Filled with admiration for their heroic faith, the monarch issued a decree that all men, far and wide, throughout his empire, should revere the God of these Hebrews, and that every people, nation, or language that spake a word against their God should be cut in pieces and their houses made a dunghill. Daniel 3, verse 29. End of Book 11, Chapter 1. Recording by Olivia. Book 11, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. Book 11. Chapter 2. Reigns of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Darius. Daniels chapter 4 through 6, B.C. 570 to 538. Though from the incident just recorded, Nebuchadnezzar had learnt to know the greatness of the God of Israel, a still sterner lesson was needed to teach him his own position in reference to the Most High. He was by far the greatest of the Babylonian monarchs. His name was known his power was dreaded throughout the entire eastern world. He was the conqueror of Syria, of Phoenicia, of Tyre, of Palestine. He was the adorner and beautifier of his native land. He built noble cities, he raised stately temples, he renovated, fortified, almost rebuilt Babylon. He constructed quays and breakwaters, reservoirs, canals and aqueducts on a scale of grandeur and magnificence surpassing everything of the kind recorded in history. Perhaps no single man ever left behind him as his memorial one half the amount of building which was erected by this king. The palace he built for himself in Babylon with its triple walls, its hanging gardens, its plated pillars, was regarded in his day as one of the wonders of the world, while even at the present hour it is his name which is stamped upon well-nigh every brick found amidst the ruins of his capital. Amidst all this earthly grandeur, he had grown and become strong. His greatness reached unto heaven and his dominion to the end of the earth. Inflated with pride, he became a god unto himself, and knew not that he was but an instrument in the hand of him who ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Daniel 4 verse 17 This was the lesson he had now to learn, and he learned it on this wise. One night he dreamed a dream, which none of his wise men could interpret. Daniel, therefore, was once more summoned before him, and listened while the monarch revealed the vision of the night. I saw, he said, and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great, reaching unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit much, and the beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh fed of it. And behold, there came down from heaven a watcher, and a holy one, who cried out, Hew down the tree, and cut off its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts, and let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given him, and let seven times pass over him. Such was the vision. What was the interpretation? Daniel did not disguise it from the monarch. The tree was no other than himself. For him there was a great trial in store. A day was near when he would be cast down from his place of power, would be driven from the society of men, and would have his dwelling with the beasts of the field, until seven times had passed over him, and he revived and knew for a truth that not he, but the Most High ruled in the kingdom of heaven, and gave dominion and power to whomsoever he would. Daniel 4 verses 1 through 27 Thus a warning was given him, but it was disregarded. 
Nebuchadnezzar did not, as Daniel bade, break off his sins by righteousness and his iniquities by shewing mercy to the poor. Twelve months afterwards he was walking in that glorious palace which he had made for himself, and in a moment of overweening pride he cried, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty? The words had hardly been spoken when his doom came upon him. The thick pall of madness settled down upon him. The mind of a man departed from him, and that of a beast entered in. Casting off his robes, he refused the food and habitation of men. Mingling with the cattle in the fields, he remained exposed to the weather day and night, till his hair was grown as eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Daniel 4 Verse 33. Meanwhile, as seems most probable, his queen Nitocris administered his kingdom, and at length, after an interval of four or perhaps seven years, as he did not scruple to declare in a proclamation addressed to his people, he came to himself. His understanding came back to him. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and blessed the Most High, and praised and honoured him that liveth for ever. With his reason, the glory also of his kingdom returned. His counsellors and his lords sought him and brought him back to his palace, and excellent majesty was added unto him. Resuming his great works, which had been suspended, he added fresh wonders in his old age to the marvellous constructions of his manhood, and after a reign of forty-three years, died, B.C. 561, at the advanced age of eighty-three or eighty-four, and was succeeded by his son, Evil Merodach. Shortly after his accession, the new king released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from the prison where he had been confined for thirty-eight years, set his throne above the throne of the other captive princes at Babylon, and gave him a daily allowance from the royal table. Second Kings 25 verses 27 to 30 But in the course of one or two years he was assassinated, and one of the conspirators, Neriglasar or Neragasolasar, usurped the throne, B.C. 559, and held the government for three years and a half, bequeathing it to his son, Laboroso Arkod, B.C. 556. In the course of nine months, he was succeeded by Nabonidus or Labinitus, B.C. 555. Meanwhile, the neighboring kingdom of Media had been the scene of a great revolution, in which Babylon eventually became involved. Mandane, a daughter of Astyages, who mounted the Median throne B.C. 595, married Cambyses, a Persian of the royal family of the Archaemenidae, and became the mother of Cyrus the Great. Alienated by his tyranny and wearying of his rule of a large body of the subjects of Astyages, transferred their affections to this prince, who, heading a revolt, defeated and captured the Median king near Pasargadae, B.C. 559, and obtained the supremacy over the combined Medo-Persic Empire. At first, the conqueror did not march against Babylon, and Nabonidus formed an alliance with Croesus, king of Lydia, and employed himself diligently in strengthening his capital, storing up provisions, and erecting defensive works. But Cyrus gained a complete victory over the Lydian king, B.C. 546, and at the end of about six years, appeared before Babylon. After a single engagement, he drove the Babylonians within their defences, Jeremiah 51, verse 30, and commenced a regular siege. At this time, Nabonidus does not appear to have been present in his capital, having fled to Borsippa after the late engagement. But he left behind him a son, whom he had, a few years before, admitted to a share in the government, this was Belshazzar, the Belshazzar of the scripture narrative. This prince made a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, his wives and concubines, and high estates of the realm, in the midst of which, heated with wine, he commanded that all the gold and silver vessels, which his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the plunder of Jerusalem, should be brought forth, and from them the assembled guests drank in honor of their various gods. But in the midst of their festivities, the finger of a man's hand was seen to write mysterious words 
on the plaster of the palace wall. Instantly, all the brightness of Belshazzar's countenance vanished. His thoughts troubled him. His knees smote one against the other. With loud voice he bade the astrologers and soothsayers be brought before him, and promised honour, place and power to any that would interpret the mystic words. But this none of the wise men of his realm could do. Amidst the alarm and confusion, the Queen Mother now entered and advised that they should consult Daniel, who seems at this time to have been living in close retirement. Accordingly he was brought in, and after declining all the monarch's promised rewards, sternly rebuked him, for that though he knew all that his grandfather's pride had brought down upon him, he had yet lifted up himself against the Lord of Heaven, and in impious triumph profaned the sacred vessels once dedicated to that God who now had sent him this message. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Daniel 5 verses 25 to 28 That very night the prophet's words were fulfilled. Having diverted the course of the Euphrates, Cyrus assaulted the city from the dry bed of the river, captured it, and slew Belshazzar, B.C. 538, thus fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah, Isaiah 21, verse 9, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah 51, verses 31 to 39. Hastening on to other conquests, Cyrus entrusted the captured city to a viceroy, known in scripture as Darius the Mede, he signalized his decision to power by setting over the kingdom of Babylon proper, either a body of councillors or provincial governors, 120 princes, subject to the authority of three presidents, of whom Daniel, now far advanced in life, was chief. Daniel 6 and verse 2. Old and grey-headed, he still remained faithful to the God of his fathers, and now moved with jealousy at his elevation, the other nobles resolved to compass his ruin. Unable to accuse him of any failure in the administration of the kingdom, they persuaded Darius to pass an irrevocable decree, like the law of the Medes and the Persians, ordaining that for a space of thirty days no one should offer up any petition to any god or man save to the monarch himself, on penalty of being flung into the den of lions. This decree Daniel regarded not. Steadfast in the religion of his fathers, he opened the windows of his chamber towards Jerusalem, and three times a day, as had been his wont, offered up his prayers to his God. The nobles now had the opportunity they had coveted, and they reported his conduct to the king. Sorely against his will, and after fruitless efforts to deliver him from their malice, Darius bade the sentence be executed. The aged prophet was flung into the den, the mouth thereof was closed and sealed with the royal signet, and the signet of the lords and princes. Fasting and sleepless, the monarch passed the night, neither were instruments of music brought before him. Rising early in the morning, he sought out the lion's den, and to his great joy found that Jehovah had protected his faithful servant, had sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. Thereupon he ordered him to be brought forth, and then issued instructions for the immediate execution of his accusers, who according to the cruel but usual oriental custom were, with their wives and children, flung into the den and torn to pieces. Not content with this, he proclaimed that throughout his vast empire, adoration should be paid to the God of Daniel, the living God, steadfast forever, who worketh signs and wonders in heaven, and hath delivered his servant from the power of the lions. Daniel 6, verse 27. End of Book 11, Chapter 2 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 11, Chapter 3 of A Class Book of Old Testament History by G. F. McClear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia. A class book of Old Testament history by G. F. McClear. Book 11, Chapter 3, Rebuilding of the Temple, Esther and Ahaz Uriwis. Ezra chapters 1 through 4, Esther chapters 1 through 10, B.C. 536 to 479. At the time when Cyrus thus became the ruler of an empire greater even than Assyria itself, 70 years had elapsed since the capture of Jerusalem in the reign of Jehoiakim, Daniel 9 verses 1 and 2. The prosperity he already enjoyed under so many sovereigns, Daniel still retained under the new monarch, and it was probably through his influence that in the first year of his reign, or B.C. 536, Cyrus issued a decree giving permission to the Jews to return to their native land and rebuild their temple. To aid them in doing so, he restored to them the sacred vessels which Nebuchadnezzar had carried off from Jerusalem and instructed the pashas throughout the various provinces to afford them every facility for their return. Ezra 1 verses 1 through 6 The majority, however, of the Jews who had for years been comfortably settled in the land of exile and had there risen to affluence and high positions, preferred to retain their settlements and only 42,360, attended by 7,337 servants, were found willing to return to their native land. Over this body, Zerubbabel, the head of the house of Judah, and grandson of King Jehoiakim, was invested with the supreme authority. He had held some office in the Babylonian court, and had received the Chaldean name of Sheshbazzar, appointed by Cyrus to the governorship of Jerusalem and accompanied by the high priest Jeshua and possibly the prophets Haggai and Zechariah with copious presents of silver and gold, Ezra 1 verses 7 through 11, he set out at the head of the returning colonists and before long reached Jerusalem. Seven months after their return, the altar of burnt sacrifice was re-erected on its ancient site and the priests and Levites offered burnt offerings and sacrifices. This done, preparations were made by the prince of the captivity for his great work, the rebuilding of the temple. A grant of money for this purpose, having been already received from Cyrus, cedar trees were brought from Lebanon to Joppa, masons and carpenters were hired, and in the second month of the second year of their return, the foundations of the second temple were laid, with all the pomp and ceremonial that circumstances admitted. The priests in their apparel with trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, Ezra 3 verses 10 and 11, sang the same psalms, to the sound of which the first temple had been dedicated, and the people responded with a great shout, which, however, was well nigh drowned by the sobs and lamentations of many, especially the older men, who had beheld the glories of the former temple. But the good work was not to proceed unopposed. Informed of their design, the Samaritans requested to be allowed some share in its promotion. This Zerubbabel and Jeshua unwisely rejected, and the Samaritans thereupon exhausted every artifice to prevent the completion of the work. After putting them to various other annoyances, they hired counsellors to misrepresent them at the court of Persia, and eventually succeeded in preventing any further progress during the reign of Cyrus and of his successors Cambyses and Smyrdas, B.C. 525-521, Ezra 4, verses 11-24. to But in the second year of Darius Hystaspes, B.C. 520, the stirring words of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, Haggai 1, verses 1-8, through 8, Zechariah 1, verses 1-6, through 6, roused once more the spirits of Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and a fresh and determined effort was made to complete the work. The Persian satraps of the province, Tatnai and Shetha Bosnai, came to Jerusalem, and after an inspection of the work, applied to the Persian court for instructions whether it was to be permitted to go on. Ezra 5, verses 6 through 17. Darius caused the archives at Ekbatana to be searched and at length the original decree of Cyrus being discovered, he reissued it, and at the same time commanded the Persian satraps, instead of offering any molestation to the Jewish colony, 
to promote the work to the utmost of their power. Ezra 6 verses 5 to 13. Thus aided, the Jews pressed forward with such vigour that in the eighth year of the reign of Darius, the temple was completed and ready for dedication. B.C. 516. This ceremony was performed with every solemnity. Numerous sacrifices were offered, the priests were redistributed into courses, and the Passover was celebrated with great rejoicings. Ezra 6 verses 15 to 22. During the remainder of the long reign of Darius, the Jews enjoyed a continuance of peace and tranquility. But in the year BC 485, Ahasuerus, the Xerxes of profane history, ascended the Persian throne. When he had reigned three years, this capricious despot made a feast for all his nobles at Susa, and on the seventh day of the revels ordered Vashti, his queen, to grace the banquet with her presence. With a due concern for her own dignity, the queen declined, which so enraged her lord that he issued a decree deposing her from her royal station, and ordering a general levy of beautiful virgins that he might select from them a new queen. Esther 2 verses 1 to 4 At this time there was living at Susa a Jew named Mordecai, of the tribe of Benjamin. Esther 2 verse 5 Having no child of his own, he had adopted his cousin Hadassah, or Esther, a beautiful orphan. Together with the other virgins, she was brought into the royal harem and found such favour with the monarch that in the seventh year of his reign, without inquiring into her kindred or people, he ordered her to be crowned in place of the deposed queen. Esther 3 verse 16 By virtue of his relationship, Mordecai too shared in the prosperity of his niece and became one of those who sat in the king's gate. Esther 2 verse 41 In this capacity, he discovered a plot of the eunuchs to assassinate the king, which he duly divulged, and they were executed while a record of his services was entered in the royal chronicles. But Mordecai had a rival for the royal favor in the person of Haman, an Agagite, that is probably a descendant of the ancient Amalekite kings. Rapidly outstripping all his other competitors, the new favorite was advanced to the highest position in the kingdom and was treated with the utmost reverence by everyone, save Mordecai only. Stung to the quick at this slight, and having discovered the secret of his rival's lineage, Haman resolved to strike a blow against the nation to which Mordecai belonged. Accordingly, he represented to his royal master that the Jews, scattered and dispersed throughout the provinces of his empire, were a dangerous and turbulent race of alien habits and religion who ought to be put to death, and from the confiscation of their property, he promised to place in the royal coffers upwards of 10,000 talents of silver. The prospect of so large an increase to his dilapidated fortunes was eagerly favoured by the reckless despot, and assenting to the cruel scheme, he placed his signet ring in the hands of Haman, who quickly saw that a decree was issued for the wholesale destruction of the Jewish exiles throughout the Persian dominions without regard to sex or age. Esther 3 verses 8 to 15 News of what was designed before long reached the ears of Mordecai. Knowing that he himself was the main cause of this bloodthirsty decree, he was filled with the utmost alarm and sat down arrayed in sackcloth and ashes at the king's gate. His strange conduct being reported to Esther, she sent to her relative to ascertain the cause and then for the first time learnt the contents of Haman's edict. In this awful crisis, she resolved to put her life in her hand and to intercede with the king in behalf of her people. Meanwhile, at her suggestion, all the Jews at Susa maintained for three days a solemn fast, and then arrayed in her royal apparel and radiant in her beauty, she presented herself before the king. The captivated monarch stretched forth the golden scepter and invited her to prefer her petition. Let the king and Haman, she begged, come to a banquet of wine. They came, but declining to make known her petition for the present, she invited the two to a similar feast on the following day. Esther 5 and verse 8 Overjoyed at these special marks of honour, Haman eagerly recounted them to his wife and family, but declared that they availed him nothing so long as his rival was permitted to retain his place at the king's gate. 
They therefore advised that a gallows of fifty cubits high should be erected, and that he should request the king's permission to hang Mordecai thereon. But that night the monarch, unable to sleep, ordered certain of the chronicles to be read before him, and now for the first time learnt the service the Jewish exile had rendered by revealing the plot against his own life. In answer to his inquiries, he had just ascertained that no mark of the royal approval had been bestowed upon his benefactor when Haman entered the court in the early morning to request that execution might be carried out upon his hated rival. The king inquired what ought to be done to the man he delighted to honour. Imagining that none but himself could be intended, the favourite suggested that he should be clad in royal apparel, crowned with the king's diadem, and mounted on the royal mule, be conducted through the streets of Susa by one of the king's most noble friends. The monarch approved, and bade him straightway confer all these marks of honour on no other than Mordecai. Not daring to disobey, he arrayed his rival in the gorgeous robes of the king, and conducted him through the streets of the city. Then, with a heavy heart, he returned home, and recounted to his family the strange events of the day. A presentiment of coming doom came over his relatives, but a hasty summons to the royal banquet cut short their deliberations. For the second time, the monarch desired to learn the queen's petition, and Esther now revealed the danger of her nation and denounced the wicked conspirator. Filled with wrath, Ahasuerus ordered his instant execution, and at the suggestion of one of the eunuchs, he was hanged on the very gallows he had constructed for his rival. Esther 7 verses 7 through 10 But the execution of Haman was but a step in Mordecai's designs for the delivery of his nation. The edict for the massacre was still in force, and couriers had already gone forth with it to the various provinces of the empire. Its revocation was forbidden by Persian law, but a second edict empowered the Jews to assume the defensive against their adversaries, of whom, banding themselves together, they slew 800 at Susa, Esther 9 verses 6 and 15, and 75,000 in the various provinces, while Haman's ten sons shared their father's fate, Esther 9 verses 12 and 16. In memory of this signal deliverance, the Jews to this day celebrate the Feast of Purim or Lots in ironical commemoration of their great enemy who had resorted to this mode of augury for ascertaining an auspicious day for executing his bloody design against their nation. Preceded by a strict fast on the 13th of Adar, the festival is celebrated on the 14th and 15th with great rejoicings. According to modern usage, the book of Esther is read in the synagogue and when the reader comes to the name of Haman, the entire assembly shout, Let his name be blotted out. Let the name of the ungodly perish. And the conclusion of the service is followed by feasting and merriment. End of Book 11, Chapter 3 Recorded by Cliff Stone of Sydney, Australia Book 11, Chapter 4 of a class book of Old Testament history. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. A class book of Old Testament history by George Frederick McClear. Book 11, Chapter 4. Times of Ezra and Nehemiah, Close of the Canon. Ezra 7 to 10, Nehemiah 1 to 8, B.C. 457 to 415. In the year B.C. 464, Artaxerxes Longamanus succeeded to the Persian throne. His reign was favorable to the Jews and was signalized B.C. 458 by a fresh migration to Jerusalem headed by Ezra, a descendant of Hilkiah, the high priest in the time of Josiah. A royal ordinance empowered him not only to receive contributions from his own nation scattered throughout Babylonia for the adornment of the temple at Jerusalem, but also to establish magistrates and judges throughout all Judea, and to claim assistance from the various pashas of the provinces through which he would pass. Ezra 7, 11 to 26. 
thus aided and encouraged ezra persuaded about six thousand of his countrymen to take part in this second migration amongst whom were many of the priesthood both of the higher and lower orders after a fast of three days at the river ahava to supplicate the divine blessing on the enterprise the expedition set out and though not escorted by a royal guard reached jerusalem in safety ezra eight thirty two ezra was well received by the jewish governors but was pained to find much to blame in the conduct of his countrymen forgetful of the commands of the law they had in many instances intermarried with the surrounding heathen tribes he therefore devoted himself with all zeal to the correction of these abuses proclaimed a fast by way of atonement for past transgressions and succeeded in inducing many to put away their strange wives at the same time he commenced a more complete reorganization of the people according to the mosaic law and the institutes of david and it is not improbable a revision and rearrangement of the sacred books ezra ten one to seventeen but though the persian monarchs had not been unwilling to render aid in the rebuilding of the jewish temple their policy had hitherto forbidden the re-erection of the city itself which still lay exposed and defenceless its walls broken down and its gates burned with fire nehemiah one three the temple and a few private dwellings being the sole result of eighty years of effort in the twentieth year however of artaxerxes or b c four forty four there arrived at sushan a deputation from jerusalem with a sad account of the condition of the city which they laid before nehemiah a jew probably of the tribe of judah who held a high position amongst the royal cupbearers nehemiah instantly conceived the patriotic design of quitting the comforts of his present position and aiding his countrymen in their difficulties with fasting and prayer he sought the blessing of the most high on his design and shortly afterwards in reply to the inquiries of the king why his countenance was so sad poured forth the deep desire of his heart and begged that he might be allowed to go to judea and rebuild the city of his fathers artaxerxes consented on condition that he return within a certain period of time and having appointed him tirshatha or governor of judea gave him letters to the pashas of the provinces through which he would pass and also to asaph the keeper of the royal forests directing him to supply timber and other necessaries for the work nehemiah two one to eight thus empowered and guarded by a troop of cavalry nehemiah set out on his journey on his arrival at jerusalem he for three days kept silence as to his intentions but after a midnight survey of the ruined condition of the city openly proclaimed the purport of his visit and the royal commission under which he was acting he advised the instant rebuilding of the city walls till which was done the colony could not but be a reproach to the surrounding tribes with their city almost deserted and the temple itself falling into decay nehemiah two twelve to twenty his project was received with acclamation and a resolution was formed to press on with the work without delay but the coming of the new governor had reached the ears of the samaritans and sambalat the horonite tobiah the ammonite and geshem and arabian employed every artifice to defeat his designs nehemiah however was not to be daunted his object was to finish the walls in the shortest possible time and he therefore directed that while one half of the people wrought at the work the other should stand by armed and ready to defend them and that the workmen should hold in one hand a weapon and in the other their tools thus by dint of incredible exertions within the brief space of fifty-two days jerusalem was again girded and enclosed the walls were rebuilt the ancient towers set up and the gateways were ready for the doors to be swung upon them nehemiah four thirteen to twenty three unable to impede by open violence the progress of the enterprise sambalet and his friends resorted to various stratagems to get nehemiah out of the city they began by proposing a conference with the governor in one of the villages of the plain of ono in benjamin four times was the proposition made and as often declined then resort was had to still a more cunning artifice 
Sambalat sent to Nehemiah an apparently friendly letter, announcing the prevalence of a rumor among the heathen nations settled in Samaria that he intended Jerusalem to become the capital of an independent kingdom, and had suborned prophets to prophesy of himself. There is a king in Judah. Such rumors were sure to reach the Persian court, but might be dissipated by a friendly conference. At the same time, Noadiah, a prophetess, and others were bribed to represent to the governor the risk he was running, and to persuade him to take refuge in the fortress of the temple. But Nehemiah saw through their designs, and refused to give them any pretext for accusing him of conscious guilt. Nehemiah 6, 1-14 in addition to these plots, the governor had to be on his guard against treachery within the city itself, where many of the Jewish nobles were carrying on a secret correspondence with Tobiah, and even espoused his cause. But in spite of all obstacles, the work went on, and the essential part of the governor's design, the building of the gates, was accomplished. Having thus provided for the external security of the city, Nehemiah applied himself with equal zeal to the correction of internal abuses. One of these was the high rate of usury, which those who had any money at their command exacted from their poorer brethren. To such an extent was this the case, that some mortgaged their fields, vineyards, and houses. Others sold or pledged the freedom of their children, while many borrowed at the most exorbitant rates sufficient to pay the royal taxes. Nehemiah 5, 1-14 the discovery of this nefarious system roused the governor's indignation. Himself noble, generous, and high-minded, he declined even the usual supplies for his own table which former governors had received, defrayed many expenses out of his own purse, and even entertained the poorer classes of the countrymen at his own table. Nehemiah 5, 14-19 With righteous sternness, therefore, he rebuked the nobles who connived at this disgraceful traffic, and convoking an assembly demanded that his enslaved countrymen should be set free, their debts remitted, and the enormous interests foregone. His rebukes had their effect. The assembly unanimously announced their willingness to accede to his demands, and abstain from such conduct in the future. Other measures for the internal welfare of the city were then proceeded with. The doors having been set up in the gates, the custody of the city was committed to Hanani, a relative of the governor. A register of the people was taken. The law was solemnly read in their hearing by Ezra, Nehemiah 8, 1-16, and the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated with due solemnities from the 15th to the 22nd of the month, Tisri. Two days afterwards a fast was proclaimed, and the people made a formal confession of their national sins, and enumerated the gracious dealings of the Most High with them, from the call of Abraham to the return from the captivity. Nehemiah 9, 6-37 At the same time they ratified a solemn covenant to serve the Lord with all their heart, and keep the ordinances of the Lord, to avoid intermarriages with heathens, to observe the Sabbaths and other holy days, and neither buy nor sell goods thereon to keep the seventh or sabbatical year, and remit all debts during it, to contribute each man one-third of a shekel towards the support of the temple service, and to maintain the customary first-fruits and tithes. Nehemiah 29-39 Having, in cooperation with Ezra, thus restored the national institutions, Nehemiah returned to the Persian court, B.C. 432. During his absence, the old abuses again began to creep in. The people contracted alliances with foreigners, neglected the Sabbath, and forgot the covenant they had so lately sworn to observe. As soon as he was informed of this, Nehemiah sought and obtained permission to revisit once more the scene of his former labors, and his Tershatha was invested with renewed powers. Returning after an absence of about nine years, he found that Elias Hib, the high priest had permitted Tobiah, the Ammonite, to occupy a large chamber in the temple, which had before been used as a store for the frankincense, the holy vessels, and the tithes of corn, wine, and oil. Thereupon he insisted on the expulsion of the intruder, and the restoration of the ejected vessels and stores, 
over which he appointed a Levitical guard. Nehemiah 13, 1-15. He next introduced measures for the prevention of traffic on the day of rest, and the celebration of mixed marriages, alike amongst the lower and the higher orders of the people, even deposing from his sacred functions the high priest Eliashib, for permitting his son Joiada to ally himself with a daughter of Sambalat the Horonite. Nehemiah 13, 15 to 28. Having thus completed his second administration, this truly patriotic and upright governor in all probability returned to Persia about B.C. 413, and there died. With this date closes the history contained in the scriptures of the Old Testament. While the mass of the Hebrew people was scattered among the nations, carrying with them wherever they went their law and their institutions, we have seen a remnant, as had indeed been foretold, restored to their own land, their holy temple rebuilt, their glorious city raised from its ruins. Very different indeed was their position now from that which the nation had occupied during the palmy days of Solomon, when their kingdom stretched from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, from the mountains of Lebanon to the Red Sea. Different too, and far less costly, was their temple in comparison with that which the artisans of Hiram had built for the son of David. But in its moral and spiritual condition, the remnant of the nation far excelled the contemporaries of its greatest king. In the furnace of affliction, it had been thoroughly purified from all tendencies to idolatry. The dreary years, when their harps hung upon the willows by the waters of Babylon, had not been without their salutary effect upon the people. There was no division now in the objects of their worship. No high places were to be seen crowned with temples dedicated to Baal or Shemash. No groves screened with their leafy covert, the impure orgies of Ashtaroth. No drums and cymbals drowned with their horrid clang, the wail of infants in the valley of Ben-Hinnon, as they were passed through the fire to appease the cruel Moloch. These oracles were dumb. The Jew was no longer an idolater. The divine unity was now the central truth of his creed. The law, once neglected, was now read, copied, studied. While Nehemiah had earnestly applied himself to the civil administration, Ezra and others after him, with no less zeal, devoted their energies to collecting, transcribing, arranging the sacred books. These were ultimately classed under three divisions. 1. The Law, containing the five books of Moses. 2. The Prophets, which included the historical and prophetical writings. 3. The Psalms or Hagiographa, sacred writings, comprising the poetical books. Meanwhile, varied as had been the fortunes of the chosen people, the assurance of a Savior of God's purpose of love in the promised seed had never been forgotten. As first made known to man in paradise, it did perhaps, as we have seen, little more than assure him of a future interposition in his behalf, without informing him whether his Redeemer should be one or many, the collective race or a single deliverer. But once again, the realization of the promise becomes the goal of sacred history. Through one of the sons of Noah, it is limited to a particular race. Through the call of Abraham, to a particular nation. Through Judah, to a particular tribe. When the people flee away from the terrors of Sinai, Moses predicts the coming of a greater prophet and a mightier mediator. When the scepter rises from Judah and David sits upon his throne, he himself speaks of a greater king, of one he calls his Lord, who shall sit upon his throne, and of whose kingdom there shall be no end. When the mournful close of Solomon's reign proves that he could not be the destined king, when his kingdom was rent in twain, and his subjects become a prey to their enemies, and are carried off into far distant lands, even then the very sadness of the captivity only serves to correct the idea of the Messiah and the son of David gives place to the writings of Daniel, to the son of man. Thus each crisis of the nation's history serves to bring the promise within narrower limits and to illustrate it with fresh details. Meanwhile, as time rolls on and one prophet after another brings out some new particular foreshadowing the birthplace or the offices or the works of the Messiah, another voice begins to be heard in the temple of prophecy. It is not jubilant and glad, telling of triumph and of glory, 
of the subjugation of nations or the setting up of a kingdom. It is subdued and mournful. It whispers of suffering and rejection, of a triumph indeed, but not the triumph of an earthly conqueror. It speaks of the coming of a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, of his being wounded for our transgressions and bruised for iniquities, of his being cut off but not for himself. The earliest prophecy had declared that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, but had whispered that the serpent would bruise his heel. The latest declared that the Messiah should triumph, but also that he should die. Thus gradually but harmoniously was the person and work of man's Redeemer unfolded. And at length in the fullness of time a babe was born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger, seed of the woman of the race of Shem, of the descendants of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of David. He lived, he died, he rose again. Prophet like unto, but infinitely greater than Moses, he gave us a law which shall never pass away. Priest like unto, but not as Aaron, compassed about with infirmity, he offered up on the altar of his cross a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, atonement and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. King like unto, but infinitely higher than David, he sitteth at the right hand of God, clad in the glorified nature of the race he came to save, the predicted Redeemer of the Old, the revealed Deliverer of the New Testament, in whom there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, neither bond nor free. End of Book 11, Chapter 4 End of a Class Book of Old Testament History by George Frederick McClear